honestly, I need you to take me shopping because I, I don't, I don't, like I'm, I'm on a TV show now twice a month, fortnightly. What is happening, all you highly evolved primates? My name is Rich Roll. I appreciate that the illusion of free will has directed you to our wavelength in this particular time-space dimension. And I hope it finds you loved in a space of gratitude, in a mindset of gratitude as well. I wrote that as well. In a space of gratitude, <laughs> in a mindset of openness and prepared to receive because because I am joined once again by my favorite edge lord of words literary, of actions activist, of contributions environmentalist, my waterkeeper comrade and caretaker of lands wet and arid, Mr. Adam Skolnick. Great to be here, Rich. Once again. You know, kudos on that paragraph. Although I, I messed it up a little bit. With double you know, gratitude? It's okay. It's okay to double, double down. If you're gonna double down on anything, gratitude is not a bad place Gratitude's to do it, the right? way to go. <laughs> yeah. um, and I am a highly evolved primate. You, as we all are, <laughs> hopefully, with hopefully. more evolution ahead of us. Yes, and I, I get that reminder every morning because I have a, a small primate at home. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> Less highly evolved, but soon to be evolved. But or maybe some, more highly in evolved. In some ways, more highly yeah, evolved. Yes. We can all learn from the young ones among us, can <laughs> yes, we not? Yes. Um, happy to be back with you today. Uh, last time we appeared together was pretty heavy. Yeah. This one's gonna be a little bit lighter with some flex, a light dusting of heaviness in the middle. A light dusting of uh, we're all gonna die right in the middle. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, just a, a little <laughs> thin veneer of existential dread before we get back to the jocular. Yes, uh, because you know what? Why not laugh? While we're all going down the tubes, is that what you're saying? <laughs> this is life. I am an optimist. <laughs> I have confidence in humanity and solving our problems. I do too. Before we get into all of that, for those that are new or newer to this particular corner of this particular podcast, Roll On is our bi-weekly. More on that later. Don't, don't think we're not done talking about bi-weekly. We got more to say about that. <laughs> you're sticking with it It so is far. our bi-weekly <laughs> Momentary movement, our periodic pivot away from my traditional fare of evergreen conversations to hone on matters of contemporaneous import. And today, in the interest of always playing around with and tweaking the format, we're gonna do that again, but with a minor twist. After a bit of our typical ribald banter, we're gonna indulge you with a brief conversation with legendary environmental activist and Arctic swimmer, Lewis Pugh which is exciting. I think you guys are gonna really enjoy it. Followed by a more, at times, philosophical discourse on some of the more important things I've learned over the nine years of doing this thing, this podcast, what it is I'm trying to accomplish, uh, what we can all learn from what I've learned going through this experience. And then of course, as always, we answer a few questions submitted by you guys, the audience on our voicemail, which is, get out a pen, everybody, 424-235-46. Two, six. But before Lewis joins us, Adam, how goes you? Well, Rich, I've been replaced. I see you across from me right now. You haven't been replaced yet. Not by you or Brogan, but by the Malibu artist. What happened? He met Orlando Bloom. <laughs> <laughs> right. You've been <laughs> supplanted as his favorite muse. I can't, I can't even fault him for it. Well, like, first if, of all, explain to people or remind people who the Malibu artist is. The Malibu artist um, is my friend who's a drone pilot and he's got Malibu artists on Instagram and YouTube, great channel. Mm -hmm. He's one of these like new school nature videographers that like has a home on YouTube, does very, very well. And he is for the last several years, gone up and down the coast and, and shooting sharks in the water, not far from swimmers and surfers. We've talked about it before. He's, he's uh, captured me in the water, not far from a uh, white shark where I normally swim. And he was in Malibu doing one of his recon flights and uh, Orlando recognized him uh -huh. and came up to him and they started chatting and Orlando was getting ready to stand up paddle. And he's like, is there something out there right now? And because he's a fan of of uh, Carlos, and 
they found it. He showed it to him. And next thing you know, Orlando's out there like, you know, kneeling over a white shark right. on his board. And they've just hit it off. So yeah, they've done a couple different missions together. Right. Yeah. Um, Blake, maybe you can pull up Orlando Bloom's Instagram where he shares the video that the mm-hmm. Malibu artist created of him stand up paddle boarding. Um, well, he's looking for that. I think that's funny. Yeah. Um, you you are a stepping stone in his uh, ascent to fame, right? Like yes. it's kind of like when uh, a friend of yours starts a podcast and they ask you to be like one of the first guests when yeah. there's no audience, right? And then you do it and then you realize like, oh, I'm just a launch pad for you to get other people. Right, <laughs> right. And by the time there's a big audience, like you're the guy who was on when no one was paying attention. I was OG like, con- like a conscious shark bait. He he was filming like unwitting swimmers and surfers. I was like the guy who knew what was going on and got in there. Right. And now you he's had got... belief in him early on. <laughs> and now Orlando. But now you have been discarded, <laughs> summarily dismissed. I, I literally asked him, hey, I'm going, you want to meet up? I'm about to go for a swim. He's like, oh, I've got Orlando. I've got Orlando. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> So here it is. Uh, if you're watching on video, um, Blake, pull it up. Is there music on there too? Or could we just watch the, the video? So there's Orlando Bloom. Yeah. He shared it on his Instagram. But look at him. He's Shot right from there. above. And there's the shark Props right there. Props to Orlando. Like, he's maybe like, like three, four feet away from him. Yeah. Right underneath him. Stud. So I will say, in addition to megawatt movie star charisma that Orlando is bringing to this epic production, <laughs> The proximity of the shark is more impressive than in the video that he made of you, where it was right. like, you know, 50, 60 meters away from you. Well, it's easier to get there on a stand up paddle board. And mm. you know, exa- he knew exactly, like he was going front, like he was, he had something to follow on the board. Whereas when I was swimming, he was, he didn't find it till I was in the water. But, you know, point taken, Orlando's better on camera. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <He's-> <laughs> Um, While we're at it, we should probably also share, uh, we're gonna talk about this a little bit more later, but I participated in the Malibu Triathlon this past weekend. And there was another drone shot of the elites, the pros in the Super League Triathlon series who competed this past Saturday. There's a drone shot of the swim group from above and there's a shark pretty nearby. Yeah, Uh, And that kind of spread among the triathlon community pretty pretty rapidly over the weekend. So Blake, pull that one up. I just saw it there a second ago. There you go. You can play that. Yeah. So you can see that, you know, the big group of swimmers and there's the sharks, maybe 20 meters. Yeah, he's waiting for the end. He wants to get the stragglers. Oh, he's coming closer. <laughs> oh no, it's just zooming up there. So yeah, there's a or, there's a yellow circle around the shark. Um, yeah, that's yeah. good enough. So uh, another one of my regular swim being, areas. Being down, yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is on Zuma Beach. Uh, not exactly, you know, like considered to be some kind of um, you know reef where sharks congregate. Uh, and this was the topic of much conversation amongst all the athletes and participants uh, over the course of the weekend talking about this. Many of them who were swimming for the first time in a triathlon or didn't have a lot of ocean experience. And they're like, I hear there's sharks, there's sharks out. And I had to remind them the refrain that you explained to me, which was this idea, which is fundamentally kind of behind the Malibu artist's premise, which is the sharks are always there. Yeah, They're all around you. They actually really don't want anything to do with you. For the most part, they're minding their own business. It's a nice reminder that it's their terrain, their home, not ours. Uh, but for the most part, you know, you can be afraid seeing that, but you can also equally choose to see it as um, somewhat safer, given that they're seemingly disinterested in humans for the most part. And Although just that the knowledge one looked that a little around. interested, like vaguely interested, that one. He, he was sniffing around the edges, <laughs> but he didn't bother anyone. No, he didn't bother anyone. Um, that area actually, Zuma, it runs to, between Trancus and and all the way to Paradise Cove is a marine protected area where we swim often is around Point Doom, a little bit further, uh, I guess it's Southeast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, we have seen, you know, dolphins with a bite out of them. We have seen sea lions uh, (laughs) decapitated and beach themselves. (laughs) We've seen, we've seen, Uh, there are, there is, I mean, even uh, Carlos would say, he, he knows the sharks that do come around there are actually tend to be bigger than the ones where I am swimming in the Palisades. So 
Um, no, it is a shark area. They they ping off those buoys. The whole area is a shark area. You know, like like you like I've said before. If you there's a good test to find out if there's sharks in the water. You stick your finger in the water and you lick it, and if it's salty, there's sharks. Mm. Is that too much? Is that dad humoring? I think we just found the the standout quote for the whole podcast. Yeah, put that on the thing. Right, the tile, the title. If the, the water is salty, it's shark infested. <laughs> I didn't say infested. No. Um, anyway, also doing well. Props to April. Uh, my wife, April Wong, is training for a half marathon. Nice. We'll get into half marathon stuff a little bit later, but um, her training is rocking. She ran 10 miles yesterday. Um, she's also on Noom, by the way, for the first time. She's like, she's she wants to get any semblance of the baby uh, body out of her life and she's lost seven pounds in less than two weeks on mm. noom which is kind of a psychological like psych psychology based platform with uh, uh kind of mindful eating and good eating habits and and with a psychological background i don't know if you've ever heard of it but i'd never heard of it i hadn't no I'd, I'd my sister lost 20 pounds on it and then april decided to take it we were just up at my sister's and april decided to take a look at it and so she's doing that kind of concurrently and it's going really well. So props to her. That was really cool. That's cool. Yeah. And did we recap your Alcatraz swim last time? I can't remember. I don't think so because it was before. Right. Remember we moved That's it before. Right, we, yeah. we taped early, then right. you were gone. So we haven't gotten the full breakdown. So this I'll is going to be a whole race report oriented <laughs> podcast. There's a lot I of guess, race report. Right? I'll give you my basic race. But I was hoping, I was, to be quite honest with you, slightly annoyed with my performance because I'd been getting better and a little bit faster for me. And I had my goal of, I thought for sure I'd break an hour and I, I wanted to break 50 minutes. Mm -hmm. It's an 1.27 mile swim. I ended up covering 1.6 miles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which hurt my, hurt my time. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then I, I still think I had the hour within my grasp until you see my finishing kick. Uh, Blake, can you can you zoom in on my? Yeah, so we're pulling up incredible. Blake's look at my Strava. line. Look at that beautiful line. Uh, and then look at that. That once you're in Aquatic Cove Park, you're basically there. It's still water. You're done. Why are you going up Back. and down and backwards? You might ask why I'm going backwards at that moment. Yeah. I I am asking <laughs> you that actually. Do you have an answer? <laughs> I had no idea. So for sure, there's a there is one reason. There were there were sailboats in the cove, which I wasn't I didn't know, and so I had to go around like three different sailboats. But mm. that certainly doesn't mean you should go backwards. There should be a right. forward way. Um, there are a couple of reasons why it was it was difficult for me. First, more difficult was that it was it was actually a warm day. It was 64 degrees, so it was perfectly comfortable. I was in no wetsuit. That's warmer than the Pacific this past weekend. Oh yeah, definitely. And it was there was a chop, there was a um, a cross current that made it a little more challenging. And then sighting is more challenging. I'm used to swimming along the coast, so crossing even a small channel like that. Did they have buoys up? They had kayakers. Oh right. And so I we were like I was with my buddy John Moore, who I swim with out here. And he and I both said, let's go out because there's, because the, Antonio told us, go a little bit further to the right and then you'll catch the current towards in. Towards the bridge. Toward, yeah, go a little bit towards the bridge and then catch the current in. We thought, we had, we went a little too far out. Mm -hmm. And then we caught the current in, which was good. But by the time I got to Aquatic Park, I thought I was, I, I just kept going the wrong way. Um, many times I thought the finish line was on the far side. It turned out it was on the near side and I, I screwed it up. So... You know, the bottom line is I've done a 5K swim. I've done Alcatraz. Um, and I've done a four-mile swim once in, in the Bahamas ages ago. And each time I came near the end, never last, but very close to last. This time, at least, I was in the middle of the pack. Uh -huh. So, like, there is that. I did better. That's huge. Yeah, but also I, I didn't make, make my goal time. And I am slightly annoyed, which means I have to do Alcatraz again. Right, but yeah. if you zoom out and you can see this arc in your trajectory, yes, that's typical. And I think that that was wise advice to tack to your right, um, because at, it, we talked about this before. Like the longer you you start in between the ebb and the slack, right? Yeah, like yeah. so, there's this kind of dead zone that is very temporary, but quickly the tide is going to start coming in, and you know that you're going to get pushed to your left. So it is wise to tack to your right. 
the idea is that in that tacking, then as the, the tide picks up, you're gonna get pushed to your left. And ultimately what you're gonna see is a straight line, not quite yeah, as arced as that, but- that, that, It's not even really arced, it's more jagged. Like if you if you really zoom well, in you on have all that, these- <laughs> In the middle there, there's something weird it's going on <laughs> where suddenly you started swimming out towards the, 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 yeah. the Golden Gate Bridge no, for some no, reason. No, Rich, that's art, <laughs> that's art. Yeah, that's, that's Strava art, That's right? Strava art, I was trying. <laughs> It's trying to. I you was, should have spelled Zuma. You that's know, out that's there. a cry for help. Is what mm. that is. Um, but nice job. You did hey, it thanks. without a wetsuit. Thanks, man. Uh, I would have liked to have seen the starting position a little bit closer to Alcatraz. It's, it's a permit situation. Is that and what it, it is? The, the boat was close to Alcatraz. I don't know if that's maybe where the GPS picked it up. You know how that happened. I don't know if that ever mm. happens with you. My watch d definitely it happens. You are in the shadow of the island, but you can't start on the island for whatever right. reason. So you did it in one hour and two minutes. Yeah. You have a 213 per hundred yard pace. It's in the record books. What I did, I, I swam too, too long. How is that like, is, is that amount of, is that normal if to swim 1.6 for a 1.3? Do you think, and in, in, like, do you, do you think you swam well, close? Well, let's, let's, let's pull up my Strava from the Malibu triathlon, yeah, let's, let's see what... which was <laughs> yesterday. Um, zoom in on that. I mean, obviously this is a shorter, is a quick little swim. What I see is a very straight line, Adam. <laughs> now, I concede that there are difference in, differences in current. I had buoys, I had all kinds of things, but what you don't see are a lot of jagged lines and you don't. bowed out arcs really or don't. anything like that. <laughs> you don't. You Wait. also see a 109 per 100 yard pace. Yes. Now, I will couch that with the caveat that there was a little bit of running. I had to run into the water and then I had, oh. you know, a jog out up onto the sand and then to the transition and you area. Wore a wetsuit. Which lo I was wearing a wetsuit, yes, which obviously lowers the pace. There's me coming out. See all those people around there? They all have see how they all have different colored caps? Yeah. That's because they were from earlier heats. So don't be confused. Oh. <laughs> those people did not start with me. They started many minutes ahead. And they didn't so I'm going to blow with you. blow my own horn a little bit. They finished behind you. That's they're, a nice little uh, uh, nice little like surf behind you. There was some surf there was, out there. There was it was pretty chill out there. There's just a, there was just a beach break at the okay. end. I mean, I, it, it was actually very calm. It was the conditions were great. The water was fine. I didn't see any sharks, although I was comforted and knowing they were all around me the whole time. Um, we'll get into more about the Malibu triathlon in a minute, but- um, But that's a over but, that's over half, it was supposed to be a half mile swim and you swam a couple hundred yards too too long as well, well right? Yeah, it's tw it says 1200. I thought maybe the swim was longer cause it was supposed to be, I thought it was like a 700 meter swim, which well with the running part, it got added to it cause I didn't okay. turn the garment off until I was in the transition okay, zone. So okay. there was a good, I don't know, more than a quarter mile of running. That's a hell of a pace well, though, so. dude. I, I don't want to spoil it. You tell the you tell the story, but you you really kicked ass. Well, it, I mean, look, we had fun. So here's how it came about. Alexi Pappas, podcast favorite, um, contacted me. She said that she'd been contacted by the Malibu Triathlon and invited to do the celebrity race as a relay. She wanted to know if I would do it with her, which of course that sounds like fun. Um, and she got her bestie, Mary Kane involved, also friend of the pod. So this is a pod, podtastic, you know, relay team yeah. that we put together. Um, but Mary, isn't Mary a runner? Mary, you know, for those that don't know, was the greatest runner of her generation right. as a young person. Her career didn't really pan out as she would have liked. She had experiences training under Albert, Alberto Salazar, right. the Nike Oregon project that kind of derailed expectations around her becoming this great Olympic champion. She has now emerged from that phase of her life and started this running team called Atalanta, Atalanta in New York City. That's all about uh, women empowerment, athlete empowerment. And she's been spending time on the bike. So she, she doesn't have any experience racing bikes or doing triathlons, but she was doing the bike leg, Alexi, the run leg, and I agreed to do the swim leg. And I thought this is gonna be great, first of all, crazy that we'd, we would be invited to do the celebrity division of this race. Cause it's like, like, are they hard up for like, like traditionally over the years, right. like the Malibu triathlon is like an institution in Malibu. Yes. And it's the celebration, not only of multi-sport, but of our community. And it's really the only multi-sport race that I'm aware of where there's this intersection between 
the entertainment industry like Hollywood with something athletic. And over the years, it's been graced by many an A-list movie star. Like J-Lo. J-Lo did it. I remember when she did it. Matthew McConaughey's done it. Like a lot of people that you know from movies and television participate in this. They raise tons of money um, for Children's Hospital, I believe, and various charities over the years. So I thought this will be hilarious. Let's do it. We're actually all athletes. I wouldn't consider us celebrities in the traditional sense, Hmm. Um, but we should just destroy this because (laughs) like we're gonna be competing against people on reality TV shows and like sitcom actors and people on CBS shows or something, you know, like (laughs) like this this is gonna be great. Rizzoli, you're gonna compete against Rizzoli. (laughs) Rizzoli and and Isles and (laughs) and the guys from Suits, (laughs) like (laughs) stuff like that, right? because that's the way it's always been. right? Uh, and what was really fun and fantastic and surprising and amazing and also uh, like tricky about the whole thing is we show up and it turns out that there are a couple people that you know from tel- like Chase Crawford, like people who are in movies and television, uh, there was like five or six of those types of people. Um, but for the most part, all the relay teams in the celebrity division were stacked with professional triathletes and Olympians. Like basically all of the people who medaled in the Tokyo Olympics in triathlon were, were all like on various relay teams. So why? way more often than, than not, like these, these teams were, were propagated by legit, like, you know, elite athletes in their prime triathletes in their, in their prime. <laughs> Doing a shakeout. And not reality TV stars. <laughs> and part of that is because, you know, just for some context, an organization called Super League Triathlon, which is this new race series in triathlon that's oriented around like really good prize money for the triathletes, as well as trying to get audience excitement around triathlon because they they reimagined the format to make it much more watchable and exciting for mm. the viewer. And it's a big deal in Europe. They They do all these races as part of a circuit. They accumulate points. Well, Super League Triathlon, the organization, purchased the Malibu Triathlon, so they now own it. And this was the first North American um, instance of Super League Triathlon you know, being conducted uh, in this part of the world. Um, so on Saturday, that was the, all the pros raced and you have like the Olympic champion, Christian Blue. Hmm. You had Lucy Charles Barkley, who just won the 70.3 World Championships a couple of weeks ago. Like all of these super elite, you know, young people. And then they just took all of those incredible athletes and said, we'll put you guys on relays in the celebrity division. <laughs> so a lot of them had like two Olympians or like, you Crazy. Know, and then they'll have, they'll have one person who's kind of like the Achilles heel, like right. Hollywood person or whatever. Um, so that changed the, com- the sort of complexion <laughs> of this whole thing. Cause we're going in going thinking, we're, well, gonna, dis- we're gonna destroy this you thing. Like win. there's nobody who's gonna come <laughs> anywhere near to us. And I that, that was a big catalyst for getting me back into the pool and right. like training with some intentionality oh, right. around it. So right. not that I'm in any kind of race fit, you know, situation right now, but at least I've been mixing it up in the pool and felt comfortable kind of getting after it. Um, so we show up at the transition area in the morning, you know, and it's like, we're, we're racking our bike right next to Lucy Charles Barkley, you know, and then there's Christian no relation, Blue. No relation. Yeah, no relation to the Charles Barkley <laughs> from the NBA. Yeah. Um, but, you know, a, like a superstar in mm-hmm. triathlon. And there's, I had met Christian Blue uh, a couple nights prior at an event. And then there he is. And he had another Tokyo Olympian doing the swim on his relay. Like, and he was it was r- like running. the transition area felt like being in the transition area of like the elite performers in all of the sport. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> Which was great. So, yeah. so I so I line up for the swim. I'm doing the swim leg, and uh, and I'm looking around, and I'm and I'm not seeing a lot of like elite type people. So I thought, hmm, maybe I maybe I got this thing sorted out. Like, I think I'm in good shape. And they're counting down They're like the two minute warning, the one minute warning. And then with like 30 seconds to go before the gun was going to go off for our heat, uh, like five or six athletes suddenly like run up from the water and like join our group. Like they'd been like the real triathletes had been, had been in the water warming up, you know, and they show up the last minute and I was like, oh, never mind. <laughs> Were you were you at yeah. the front? Did you like know yeah, your was way like, to the front? Yeah, I'm like looking. Where's my line? Like, where do I line up? Yeah. And like, yeah, I'm very like, you know, I'm, I'm all about that. Um, 
so my aspirations for like winning, you know, my heat of the swim went out the window. You, but didn't, we run you in, didn't get wet first at all. You, you no, were, you were no. dry. Yeah, I, was, I should have. I should have actually. Does that help getting a little yeah, wet first? Yeah, of course. Yeah. You should warm up. Yeah. I don't know why I didn't. That was dumb. Um, but anyway, we run into the water and to the first buoy, I was right up, you know, I was in, I was sort of on the heels. I, I was in the lead pack, but kind of in the, the back part of the lead pack of like five or six people. Um, and we round the first buoy and head alongside the shore. And I lost touch with, I lost touch with that group. I fell off the back and I thought, oh man, like I thought I was like a better swimmer than maybe I am. Like I need to, I need to like reevaluate. Like You're I, reevaluating I, your life. Yeah. On that I'm like, I'm stretch. like, I need to rethink. Like, cause I, I was like, I'm a pretty good swimmer. Like of people my age, there aren't very many people my age that can swim, you know, as no. well. And, 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 but I, so I thought I could be competitive with any of these people. And when I fell off the back of that group, I, I, I literally was like, yeah, I was examining my life. I thought, <laughs> you know what? You've really indulged your ego here. Like this, you're you're really not all that, dude. Like so you need to really recalibrate. You're and, just lashing and yourself. You need a lot more training. And you're like, I'm running this whole thing in my head the whole time. Yeah. You know, you're like, how dare you, Rich? How dare you? And then I get out. You know, we run up the shore, and and the thing is, like, there's a bunch of like we were the fourth wave or something like that. So you start, you start catching up to the waves before the slower people in the waves before you, and then it becomes like this obstacle course of just like swimming around all of these people run up on shore, have a much longer run of the transition than I would have preferred. That was actually the hardest part of the whole thing. Is that why you were and doubled I'm, over? Were you I was tired from the tired. run or from the, the swim? The run was really the thing that that like blew me out. Because I have when you get out of the all. water in soft sand, it's grueling. It's that, like, but yeah. then you run up and then you're on pavement. They have right. like this carpet on this pavement to take you. And, and the, 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 the transition area for like the quote unquote celebrity division was all the way at the end. So you had to run through the entire transition area for all of the participants to get okay. to the very, very end. So yeah, I was definitely fatigued and I, and I was beating myself up. Oh, God, I thought I was gonna be better. I was gonna be out with the lead group. Um, and they were like, no, you were fine. Everybody who beat you was a professional. <laughs> So then I felt better. <laughs> but you weren't- No non-professional triathlete beat me out of the water. So that was my, like, that's the thing. But you I'm also said you were on. in a group of five and you fell off the back. I think I really, came out, I came out fourth. Yeah, I think. you came out fourth. And then I looked at the results. Apparently, so the, so the organization sends you the results. And the funny thing is I get this email and they're like, here's your results. We don't publish the celebrity division results. I thought that was interesting. Why not? Yeah, I couldn't find them. I was they, looking like, for them. They don't want that on the internet. Like if some TV person doesn't want anyone to know like right. how long it took him to run, you know, the come thing on, or whatever. It's like, but anyway, on. so yeah, I was like, I think the I was 13 something, 13, 15. The fastest was 11, 25. Amazing. And then there were a couple 12. So I was a minute and a half or, or whatever off, off the back of people who do this for a living who are right. in their 20s. So then I felt a lot better about myself. Then- Good, good job. Alexi gets on or- um, Mary gets on the bike. She does phenomenal. Like she doesn't even have a proper cycling kit. This is how new she is to, and she got a flat like before the thing even started. Who fixed her, it? And she fixed she, it? she thought her brake was wrong. Yeah, like when I'm swimming, she's like, I have a flat. She got Christian to help her fix her bike. She got the guy who won the gold medal in the Olympics of triathlon <laughs> to help get her bike sorted out in you're time. You're in the right team. You're on, that's yeah, when you know which you're is on amazing. the right team. <laughs> uh, so Mary goes off. She has a great ride. Uh, you know, for somebody who has no experience. And Alexi, of course, is like the team captain and the cheerleader and she's mugging for the camp. I mean, she, I mean, Alexi is just unbelievable. I wish she's they could both superstar. be here today to share. Mary had to fly back to New York. Um, maybe we'll get Alexi in here um, for a future Coach's Corner and we can talk more oh, about what went, out, what went down. She was phenomenal. And- How'd she um, run? she do like- She did great. Like sub she's, six she's minute miles and stuff? such a champ. I don't know what her pace was, but it was fast. Like yeah, it's bet. not a joke. Like yeah, yeah, she's yeah. for real. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. You know? I was thinking it had to be um, in the fives, right? Per mile, don't you think? I would have to look. Yeah. I would have to pull it up. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. But we held our place. So I think we, yeah, we ended up fourth, which- Considering that we were racing against teams that had, you know, two Olymp we were the fastest team that had less than two Olympians on it. Mm. <laughs> less than two. So we didn't win, but I feel really good about how we did. Most importantly, we had a really fun time. And it was cool to mix it up with those Olympians and joke around with them and stuff like that. So super fun. Um, shout out to my boy Dylan Efron, who 
did he was in the celebrity division, but he didn't do it as a relay. He did it the whole thing himself, and he took the W for the men's really? individual. Is that he's, rela- he's an incredible is he related athlete. to Zach Efron? Yeah, he's Zach's brother. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, incredible athlete, and showed up and and rocked it out. Rocked it, yeah. Um, Cool. I would like to shout out Julie Shakia, who's a swimmer that swims with us at Point Doom a lot. And she swam collegiately at Cal State Northridge. She had a team with her niece, Raven. And uh, and Raven was on the bike, a bike she had just bought like 10 days before. She's a great athlete uh-huh. too. She played tennis in, in college at LMU. And uh, Julie swam, like I said. And they, they Julie was fourth out of the water in the on the Saturday race. Mm. And they finished 11th overall. That's great. And uh, yeah, so they did amazing. And uh, so shout out to them. What a great event. I, you know what? I would have loved to have been part of it. Maybe I'll, I'll orient my life next year towards trying to. You should. Yeah, At a yeah. minimum, being the swimmer on a relay would be fun. No one's really asking me to do that. No. Well, <laughs> we have a whole year to campaign for that. I, need, I will I say need, this. I need to get faster. Lots of podcast fans out there this yeah, weekend. Cool. So thank you to everybody who came up and said hello took lots of selfies with cool. people. And there was a lot of um, collegiates there. So a lot of colleges sent their triathlon teams. So there were packs of like young people like the Air Force Academy and you, you know this university, that university. Cal had a huge team there. Um, and it was really fun to you know talk to all the college kids and to see, especially the collegiate women, young the girls, young women, um, responding to Alexi and Mary because they're That's just awesome. like icons to young uh, female athletes. And it was really cool to see that interaction. That's awesome. And just to celebrate multi-sport and do it in a really supportive environment and celebrate Malibu and the you, oceans and the sharks. You guys seemed like you had a great time. So right? yeah, it was really fun. It like comes across in all the videos. It was really fun. Yeah. And how's the uh, overall kind of, you said this was the impetus to take swimming more seriously, but you've been, I mean, you've been, in the pool and in the gym, how's that all going? How's your back it's good. Feeling? I mean, I feel like I'm at the very beginning of it. Um, you know, my body's gotten a lot bulkier from being in the gym and swimming a lot. I'm more top heavy than mm-hmm. I'm used to feeling. And that's like weird. Sometimes I like it, sometimes I don't, but I am enjoying focusing on swimming. It is my strength. And it's the one thing that, um, you know, I haven't like, ever really fully indulged as a as a later stage athlete. You know, like I've mm. done all these triathlons, but I've never really focused on like, what if I doubled down on the thing that I'm best at and see where that can take me? And I'm kind of interested in exploring that right now. So like it's been for fun. masters or for channel crossings? More or more like, yeah, like open water, distance swimming. Let's Fantastic. see, you know, what what's, what's in store there. Um, and it was really all catalyzed by this back injury that has forced me to take a little bit of a break from running. So it's that idea of, of you know, making lemonade out of lemons a little bit or identifying the opportunity and the setback and just saying, okay, well, this is where I'm at. Here's what I can do while I'm trying to sort out my back issues, which I'm actively, you know, working on, um, working with this wonderful woman named Monica Leslie, who actually she was introduced to me by Alexi and she came down for the race as well. Um, she's really been helping me out with a whole variety of exercises and I've been in the gym and just approaching it with intentionality. So yeah, we'll see. Um, We'll see, but it was fun. It was fun to, Catalina what? Oh, doing the Catalina swim? Yeah. I don't know if Hank Wise has anything to say about it. Hank Wise called us. I'll play you you the message. (laughs) You should hear, uh, yeah, I'd like to hear that. Hank is the best. Yeah, yeah. I want to meet him. Yeah, he's great. So for those that don't know, Hank was a teammate of mine at Stanford who's now, um, a not only a, a very accomplished open water swimmer, but also a coach lives mm. down in the Long Beach area Shout and just a character. Likewise. Yeah, he's a character. And yeah. he does all kinds of like recipe videos on Instagram. <laughs> he's Dolphin Boy on Instagram and he makes like <laughs> vegan salads and stuff Dolphin like that. Boy? He's just, he's so charismatic and I'm entertaining. Him. Yeah, and he has the record for the fastest Catalina crossing. Oh, he does, okay. Yeah. Well, the reason I brought up Catalina is because, you know, that's the Jim McConica tale is he was, Jim McConica was uh, uh, a storied USC swimmer. Um, he's from Ventura and he's a lifeguard now on the beach here in Malibu. But he was, uh, in, he lived in Ventura. He wasn't a lifeguard yet. He was just working. He, his family had car dealerships. And he's working in the mm. family business and making money. And I guess he turned 50. He stopped, he, he was uh, something like an eighth or, or maybe a hundredth of a second off, or two hundredths of a second off of making the Olympic team. 
1972 or something didn't happen. Gave up swimming, ended up working. Fifth in 19 when he by the time he turned 50, he's kind of overweight, and um and see he's watching stuff on the couch. He's like, what am I doing with my life? And he decides, you know, what, I'm going to get back in the pool, and he ends up setting every record for all these Channel Islands. At one point, he held every single one, mm. including Catalina. Um, I think he's got the record for being the oldest of the, the, for for time and age in, in several of them still. Wow. Um, and he's, I think he's 70, in his 70s. Now, I did a story on on him and a, um, a relay he did from St. Nicholas Island, which is be, behind Catalina. Uh, for the New York Times and kind of swam with the Ventura Deep Enders. He has a master's group called the Deep Enders. They're mm -hmm. the deep end of the pool, but mm -hmm. they also do a lot of open water swimming in Ventura. And, you know, he started, like like I said, I mean, you know, if you're, he doubled down on his strength like that, like who knows what you could do, really. Wow. That's cool. That's inspiring. Yeah. 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 And you got, Jim's great. A great guy. I think this is, this is your path. My path? Yeah. <laughs> You got the Alcatraz swim in. You got a little did, taste did, of it. You know, I did. I would. I. You know. I. I. My. My path. I liked. I. What I like about swim run and swimming is I like this idea of through courses. Like what I want to do to train before I get into Catalina is I want to do from Sunset Point to the Van Escape Park. Just do a swim run. I have this idea of like swim running, but Big Sur coastline or swimming mm. the Nepali coastline. Like I, I. That's the kind of stuff I'm interested in. The full channel swim, you have to hire a boat and you have to do yeah. it. Like that just doesn't interest me Rules. right now. Rules. Rules. You're an experiential athlete. I wear a mask, um, bro. Yeah. I wear a mask. <laughs> you do wear a mask. I swim where masks are tolerated. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how tolerant they would have been. The, the, the Malibu triathlon community, highly tolerant. Yeah. I think your mask might have tested that tolerance. <laughs> I don't you think but you'll never know until you try. <laughs> yeah, it would have been it would have been yeah. funny to see. Um, all right. So what else? We're we're uh we're both going up to um the surf ranch this week. That's right. Explain what the surf ranch is. The surf ranch, uh a, a brainchild of Kelly Slater. I don't know if he's still associated with it or not, but he's he wanted to basically create a play a way to ride the perfect waves in the middle of the you know inland somewhere mm -hmm. and so to to launch this this was the first one i think that they built there's multiple yeah. now there's one there's a there's one in waco texas right. i know is it's, that still part of the same thing i don't or think they're no. or i don't think they're owned by the same organization so i think there's a foil that kind of runs on a track that builds this wave and there's different levels and depends on which part of, I guess, the pool that you're in. Mm -hmm. I've never been to it before, but Red Bull is having a day at the Surf Ranch. Apparently, sponsors that work with WSL, because WSL owns it now, mm -hmm. are able to, like, part of the package when they sponsor a competition or whatever it else is, is they get a day at the Surf Ranch. So at this day, Kai Lenny and Jamie O'Brien are going to be there. Um, Zion Wright, the skateboarder, is going to be there. Um, I'm I'm going to go up and talk to both those surfers. Uh New York Times Sports, and you know, I'm talking to them about a couple of features on both those guys. So uh, we will see what happens. Uh, but that's my kind of impetus for me going. I'm a little terrified of surfing in front of them. Yeah, not I surfing, know, right? <laughs> but surfing in yeah. front of them. <laughs> I'm not a surfer. Indulge I mean, your I, vulnerability, <laughs> Adam. I, I've it's stood an opportunity. Up on waves, to be, it's an opportunity for performative vulnerability. When's the last? I time feel you, the same way. Like. Yeah. I've been asked before and I couldn't make the schedule work, but if I was being really honest, there was a little intimidation. It's like, I'm going to go up here. Like I, I've surfed, but I wouldn't consider myself a surfer. When's the last and time I haven't, you stood I haven't up on a wave? I mean, seven years, maybe. Like I just, I don't do years. it. You know, yeah, I don't do yeah. it. I've gone through periods where I've done it and then I can get somewhat proficient so I can kind of stand up and ride a wave. But it's been so long. Like I, I, you know, so it's like the idea of going there and like all these pro surfers are there. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to go, but they do in the, in the information that they sent us, they have like beginner baby oh. waves and stuff like that. So I think we're just going to have to get over ourselves. Dude, I'm going to give it a shot. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's been over 10 years since I stood up on a wave. I am, but having, being a guy who's written about surfing for the New York times, it makes me even doubly like, I feel like I'm going to be right. un, unmasked. As you are going to be unmasked. I've, I've been a, yes. I've, I've kind this, of profiled. This, the I'm not the really mask is really, you, this, you're hiding behind it. What, what are you, who are you, Adam? What are you hiding behind that snorkel mask? 
who is anybody rich? <laughs> um, right now, that's a deflection. Right now, I am. I'm the guy that's re-listening to the David Show podcast that you just nice. did. Just that's how much I liked it. Um, and also kind of like recognizing some some internal character flaws <laughs> yeah. that I carry. Um, but we'll have a good time. It's, I'm gl so glad you're going to come. That's yeah, gonna it's going to be fun. Yeah, I yeah. can't wait. Yeah. Um, a couple uh, running related things I want to mention quickly before we pivot. One is um, our boy, David Greenberg, just did his first half marathon Davey. this past weekend. This is a guy who, who Davey, like you have never done any <clears throat> races before, right? Like never had been a runner. You hadn't, did you play sports in high school? Not well. Not, not well. Has discovered he's running. The, he's the really, artist that I has mean, become the, a runner. The catalyst here to give full credit is, is uh, Hela Sidibe, like I think really inspired you, right? Um, but, to get after it. And you've like taken that mantle and you got serious about training for the LA Marathon. Come on over here, Davey. Come on. And Davey just ran his first race this past weekend, half marathon. Yeah. And I gotta say, man, I'm super proud of you. It's impressive. It was. So we pulled up your Strava. Let's look at the stats here. So pace, what was your average pace? 7.11. 7.11 pace in your very first so you started on a half marathon. Pace. Trying Start to, out trying 828. To chill. I, the original plan was to take my time and just finish, but then I got competitive. So we got, yeah, you start off with 828, 710, 706, 656, 659, 707, 704, 647, 650, 658, 703, 716, 640, 627. And. Impressive and incredibly consistent. And there's some hills in there too, right? So between mile two and three, I think it's called the California climb. It was a lot. Dude. Yeah, it was fun. I'm seeing a whole new thing for you, man. What's know. great has been, you've been sharing this on social media, on Davy Runs and the enthusiasm and the kind of community that you've like surrounded yourself with and like invested in with the Koreatown runners and et cetera. Like you look like you're having a lot of fun and it's almost like, um, this light has gone off inside of you. It is one of the most fun things I've ever done. And yeah, figuring that out in my mid thirties has been really cool. That's cool, yeah. man. Right. Like you, you, I remember after I started kind of doing the podcast with you guys, you did like a four mile run. You did some run that was like the first run you'd ever, you had done in maybe ages or uh -huh. something. Yeah. That was like a year ago, right? Yeah. I started like during the pandemic basically. And then you stopped for a minute, right? Yeah. And then I got burnt out. And then Hella came in. And then Hella came in and Salema doing his, um, after he was on the show, did one mile a day for 30 days. Right. Which then I decided to do. And uh -huh. then we had Hella on the show. And then I just, yeah. You've been doing it ever now since. Rocking, yeah. yeah. How's and that the Koreatown club? So fun. It's, you know, five times a week, like a big crew of people. And uh, it's really uh, exciting. That's great, yeah. man. And LA Marathon is when? November 7th. Cool. And then the Big Sur Marathon. Oh, you I April didn't know you signed up for another one. In, okay. I got into the drawing there. Nice. So, yeah. That's All not right, easy, man. that one. No. Yeah. No, <laughs> that's, that's, a a, different, that's a different animal. <laughs> yeah. There's <laughs> we'll some we'll weather see. and some hills involved in that. First. Good. Yeah, yeah. Um, awesome. Well, we'll continue to uh, share that experience. And it, it's great, man. I think, um, uh, you know, Hella has had a, a big impact on a lot of people, like having Hella on the show. Jason, um, our our producer and engineer, started his run streak after after Hella was on the show, yep, yep. and has not missed a day. I think he's like, is it in the sixty nine seventy? He's in the seventies. He's in the seventies. He might now. be at eighty. I don't know. Um, and then we got Blake, who ran what did he do? Thirteen miles with like two thousand five hundred feet of elevation That's over the right. weekend. Uh, Blake is our video dude. And we didn't, I mean, David Greenberg is our our photographer. Yeah. Um, so I love the the trickle down, like kind of, you know, impact. But of, to be honest, guess, that's what the rich real world, world crew real should world, be. you know, real world results in terms of like impacting other people, which I love. It's great. But that's what the rich world so, crew should be. You should be a bunch of people I, getting it. I hope so. It. Otherwise, yeah. what are we doing here? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like what? <laughs> what does your podcast do, yeah. Rich? Which we're going to get into a little uh, bit well, later. But watching both those guys, Davey and Blake in particular, because I have I Davey on Instagram, Blake on Strava, seeing it all happen. And uh, you're right. I mean, Blake. I mean, uh, Blake's run was really inspiring, and seeing Davey's 
footage and the way he's so happy and smiling, right. it's, it inspires the shit out of yeah. me. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really great. It's the, it's the sheer joy and glee of it all, I yeah. think, that is the infectious part of, of the way Davey's been sharing this And I've journey. seen those uh, Koreatown Run guys. They, they did a, a, a run on the beach when I was swimming one morning, and um, they did like a 16-miler like start like the whole bike path or something and uh um it's fun i mean i could see in this day and age where like it's kind of problematic to go out and party or to go to clubs mm. or to go to, even to go to shows a lot of people are doing it but a lot of people probably are still afraid to do it um to, to do something like this that you're is, is social it's probably a great thing yeah yeah and there's multiple clubs and organizations. I mean, there's the Besties. You go yeah. out with the Besties crew. Which Besties is a vegan restaurant here in LA and they've got a run crew. Um, and you're going to be spending more time downtown, right? So there's the Blacklist mm. crew down there that I'm sure you'll vibe with. So it's going to be cool. And there's, uh, I've got a crew. You do? What's your crew? April and Zuma. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Zuma in April. Zuma and April. Yeah. Zuma's out front. I'm usually pushing the baby sled. Well, she's got the half marathon thing, so. I'm the assistant. I think you're missing the opportunity here. To join her? Yeah. I'd like to. Um, it's going to depend on the weekend. Like, so she, that one is, is it the Malibu half marathon? Yeah, the Malibu half marathon. So it's the week before uh, Utila. doesn't matter. I could still do it. Um, Utila. Utila. It's just going to be a matter of, can we get someone to watch Zuma? Because he wouldn't want to be pushed around for 13 miles at my pace. Yeah. If, if Davey pushed him, he might be able to do it. But um, but at my pace, it wouldn't work. So um, That sounds like a solvable problem. Uh, but there's actually, the solvable part is that there is, you could do it virtually. And April hasn't decided if she's going to go to the race mm. or do it virtually. It's going to depend on, you know, multiple factors. So she's got to decide that. If it's virtual, then I can certainly join and do it. All right. Yeah. Um, One more running thing I want to mention is, uh, for those of you that that follow me on Instagram, you may know this already. Um, I have a partnership with 10,000, makers of the finest men's training gear on the planet. I've hinted over the past several months of a super secret uh, project that I've been working with them on. Uh, over the course of the past year. That project is coming to its fruition. It is a new line of run gear for men that we're calling FAR, which means free association run. Mm. It's essentially uh, a kit, a shirt that comes in long sleeve and short sleeve and shorts in two different color palettes uh, that are made out of recycled materials, um, tailored to my specifications. And we've made some really cool um, kind of uh, next evolution in with respect to the running shorts uh, in terms of like the liner and how the phone pocket works and all of that. I'm going to be sharing more about that because this um, product line is going to be coming out soon. I'm so excited about it. I've never worked with a company that's been so responsive to, to feedback and so interested in trying to get it right. Like these guys, we went through a bazillion iterations. They would send me sample after sample after sample. And what about this fabric? And what about that fabric? And we just went back and forth literally for a full year to get this right. And they were so committed to making sure that it was correct and that it lived up to all of our expectations and i'm really proud of what we've created and Mm. can't wait until it's available for all you guys and that i can share a little bit more about it but um we're in this kind of pre-order campaign phase right now so if you want to be um among the very first to be able to order it or to learn more when we break public with it the best way to do that is to text bty to the number 29071 um, or there's a link, uh, a URL that I will share in the show notes or in the description below if you're watching this on YouTube. Um, but excited about what 10,000 is creating and uh, excited to have you guys experience it firsthand soon enough. And when it comes out, we're going to do the next roll, that roll on in the outfit. We will for sure be in doing the gear. That. Yes, <laughs> we will be doing that for sure. <laughs> All right. When we opened the show, we talked about uh, this show being bi-weekly, this, is, this has become like a thing, right? Uh, it started when I was confused as to whether bi-weekly meant twice a week or once every, once every two weeks. Um, and then last week, you know, I, I, I 
did a deep dive into Merriam-Webster and realized that it can it actually can be accurately defined as as either like yes. bi-monthly is defined as something that occurs every other month or every other week, which is ludicrous. So that means that this show roll on can be accurately defined as either bi-weekly or bi-monthly, right. which makes no sense. None. Um, and somebody on social media forwarded me uh, a video on TikTok from this guy called Stage Door Stage Door Johnny, who does TikTok videos about problems with the English language, like on semicolons and punctuation and stuff like that. And he did a whole riff on this very subject that I shared on Instagram. And I said, Adam, I feel seen. <laughs> like, this is it. I do not feel alone anymore in not understanding what is happening with our language. So no. Blake pulled this up uh, for those that are watching on video. So let's, let's play it from the beginning. Maybe refresh the page and we can play it from the very beginning with the volume up. So that's daily, weekly, monthly, yearly. And don't forget hourly, something that happens once an hour. Of course. Now, a tricky one. What about something that happens twice a week? Bi-weekly. Good one. The prefix bi denoting two, like bicycle, binoculars. What about twice a month? Bi-monthly? Perfect. Now, what about something that only happens once every two weeks? Bi-weekly. No, that was for two times in one week. And for something that happens only once every two weeks. Actually, because most months have four weeks in them, doesn't bi-monthly cover that too? Twice a month, once every two weeks. But some months have five weeks. Plus, I want bi-monthly to mean once every two months as well. So in a two-month period, if something is bi-monthly, it either happens once or four times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Like, very good. It's so good. Um, um, but we also had listeners from across the pond way in mm -hmm. and they think it should be fortnightly yeah they were confused as to why we wouldn't just be calling this fortnightly and then what they else... don't understand is that here in america no one knows what that i didn't know what fortnight meant right that's what and then on just like i don't comments, know what a stone means well like in the comments i forget if it was youtube or if it was on your instagram but in the comments it was kind of like oh yeah americans don't use Fortnite. it was like a whole conversation amongst mm -hmm. themselves but i think we should double down on fortnightly I think so. Yeah. Like Wimbledon. Are we is the sure? Fortnite. First of all, are we sure that that's what Fortnite means? Yeah. Fortnite is two weeks. I thought Fortnite was a video game. Oh. No, I, I definitely don't feel seen. <laughs> is that the same thing as Tech Mobile? That's the last video game I played. <laughs> yeah. All right. Fortnite, it is words. Fortnite. Words, Adam. Once they have every one Fortnite. job. Their whole, the whole purpose of language is to help us make sense of reality. No, we we purposely not I to mean, I mean, obfuscate we, it. I mean, we uh, the we collect the royal we the collective we, and I mean writers. We made it complicated so you'd have to hire us. Mm. Right. We we don't want it to be easy. Right. Because then you need you're to, the gatekeeper. Right. This is this is what like the whole legal profession is founded on, <laughs> right, like creating exactly. using a bunch of Latin phrases to create a barrier <laughs> so that you don't actually understand concepts that actually aren't that difficult to understand. It, it's weird. It's like, it's it, the, if the country had been fa founded by doctors, would, would everything be just different? Or if it had been founded by like, it was founded by, by lawyers. Mm. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, but you know, we have to create rules for society, which is what the law is about. We is meaning you and your lawyer kind? We, we the royal we, <laughs> the founding fathers royal we writers couldn't found fi found anything no founding <laughs> coming from writers <laughs> um all right we got we got to careen up towards the break here but okay. i know that you wanted to uh quickly because you know in addition to your your desire to make this a swim run podcast that is supplanted only by your desire to make it a free diving oriented <laughs> podcast so i will indulge you with 60 seconds of free diving the 60 minutes, Exploration. 60 minutes and 60 seconds. Yeah. <clears throat> I just wanted to give props to Alexei Molchanov, the king of the deep, according to 60 minutes. That's what they called him. He was featured on 60 minutes. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> and he, he, he was fe featured basically his record breaking dive in vertical blue for mm -hmm. constant weight with the monofin where he broke his own world record. Um, that was featured on 60 Minutes and he was uh, interviewed and he came off really, really well. I mean, he's just uh, highly intelligent, 
really relaxed, um, a great ambassador for the sport. His goal is to eventually see it in the Olympics. Whether that happens or not, we will see. But it does seem to be having a moment again, the sport does. Um, they've been on 60 Minutes before. Will Trubridge, who's been his chief rival over the course of his career, was featured eight years ago. Also in, in Dean's Blue Hole, but not at the competition. Um, Bob Simon came out and, and did a thing on him. This was a, a different reporter. Um, but I thought he came off really well. Um, and, and I just wanted to congratulate Alexi and we can just put the link in the, in the show notes. Yeah, that's cool. What was the occasion for him being on 60 minutes now? Like it's, it's cool that free diving is right. getting this mainstream, you know, you know, every, it happens treatment. every once in a while where like people become interested in this, in, you know, interesting subculture mm -hmm. where people are uh, putting on their own competition and, and, and doing, uh, incredible things and, you know, holding their, their breath and going, you know, he went 132 meters, I think was the record he broke 132, something like that. And so that's, you know, 400 and, uh, it's like almost 500 feet. And, uh, and that's what he did on one breath. It took him almost five minutes to do it. So, you know, that alone is incredible. Who knows what the impetus is? You know, he was, he gets coverage every once in a while it comes up and then that coverage often feeds other coverage. Um, I love it. I like seeing these athletes get their due. It is interesting to see it though, like, cause I haven't, I haven't had my finger on that pulse for a while. I mean, lately I did a story on Alexi for the times recently. So that was kind of my first free diving story mm -hmm. in a long time. One thing I've noticed is the second tier, not the greatest, but like the second tier athletes are different than when I was covering it more regularly, like 2014, 15. In what way? Just, they're just different athletes because uh, it's hard to maintain this lifestyle. You're paying your oh, you just own mean, way. Yeah, I thought you meant qualitatively. Like no. just, it's new people. New people. Because they don't- A new new blood. There's not longevity exactly. in the sport. Because you have to pay for the everything. Yeah. Um, so if you're not making it your living and your lifestyle, it's hard to do it. So, but you know, the best are still the best. Um, Alenka um, and Alessia will be will be going head to head in the world championships next week. Alexi's in, in at the world championships. I think Will is not going to make it. I believe his wife is given birth to their second. So they won't, he won't be there. So kind of Alexi now it's, it's almost like similar to Novak in, in tennis, like Alexi's kind of on his own. Now there's really not someone pushing him. There's no one close to him from mm -hmm. what I can see. Um, and the women has the two great athletes like going head to head, exchanging records still. So uh, it's a great sport. It's fun to tune into. You can see even more than when I was covering it. Dive Eye, which is this company that does the underwater camera on a track, is at every major competition now. They'll be at the World Championships. So um, if you're interested in free diving, um, look for the World Championships next week. And now they're building these deep pools. Yeah, so there's deep pools. So Alexi, <laughs> Alexi is, was at a deep pool in Dubai and met- Of course, uh, Dubai is probably, met, is that where the deepest <laughs> pool is? Like. There's one in Italy that was the first, I think. And um, now there's the one in Dubai <clears throat> because one of the leaders in Dubai, I forget who it is, is really interested in free diving. Mm -hmm. And he holds the biggest, in terms of money, competition. It's a static competition face, you know, face down in the water. And that's like the biggest payday in free diving. At least it was for when I was covering it. I don't know if it's still active. And he's behind this pool, which includes little chambers and cool yeah. like fake wrecks. And it's more theatrical than these other pools. And he met, uh, Lexi met Dan Blazarian in Dubai, who's apparently taken up free diving. <laughs> he met him at the pool. And, uh, you know, Lexi has this wow. desire to you know, he wants to build the sport in the United States. Yeah. So it's, it, you know, it's like, it's like swim run. It's like even uh, a lot of sports that, that do well overseas, but haven't really um, reached their peak here. And he wants to, to create more free divers in the United States. So you get Dan Bilzerian to do to, a free to dive. Build, to build a pool maybe mm. in Vegas. That's, that's Alexi's, that's wow. Alexi's newest thing. Uh huh. I said, right. I, I said, we'll see. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll keep you posted on that. All right, well, we gotta, we gotta close this down. But I, uh, before we do that, there was also a big spread about Alexi and GQ where your book was quoted, but they didn't, they didn't give you attribution. Right. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. So there was a big spread in GQ also. Um, good story. People shared it with me. Um, they pulled quotes that Natalia gave me and, uh, and quoted it without attribution. So I did- Welcome I did, to the modern media 
ecosystem. That's the way it is. I mean, you know, for years, people have been using some of my Natalia quotes that I got and, and printed in the book and New York Times, Outside Magazine, and they've been putting them on Instagram tiles. And after she died, that was done. I, I feel, felt that was nice. You know, it's homage to her. I also, I think I'm the first to quote Wimbledon or freediving as vertical blue. That's used in marketing materials. It's all fine. But when a journalist does it, it's a little bit annoying. So mm -hmm. I emailed the guy and he apologized. <laughs> the end. But if it's digital, was it in print? I print. mean, could they just fix it's it? It's in print. Mm. But you know what? Here's the deal. I don't, the, the right, it, it happened in production. According to what the writer said, he had it in there and then they cut it out because there's word counts. I get it. Yeah. Um, a fact checker shouldn't put that writer in that position. A fact checker is there to make sure that if a writer's overlooking that or whatever, you're, you're working on behalf of the, the reporter, the editor, and the publication to make sure that those things don't happen. Yeah. Because I've had fact checkers who would never let that slide. They'd say, where'd you get that quote? She's dead now, where'd you get that quote? When was it done? And they would just figure out a way to make sure the attribution happens because that's what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. They should have said, uh, you know, told that she could, he could have said, told the New York Times or told XYZ, whatever it is, yeah. told author Adam Skolnick or in, in the book, One Breath Without My Name. Doesn't, I don't need to be name checked, but I think that writers should, you know, people in the profession should have a standard. Thus concludes our 60 second segment on free diving. It only it took three minutes. Like, it went longer than that, I think. <laughs> Concluded with a treatise on journalistic ethics. Thank you, Adam sorry, Skolnick. Sorry. Um, we'll take a quick break and we'll be back with uh, a very interesting conversation with Lewis Pugh. There you go. Sorry to interrupt the flow. We'll be right back with more awesome, but I wanna snag a moment to talk to you about the importance of nutrition. The thing is, most people I know actually already know how to eat better and aspire to incorporate more whole plants, more fruits, vegetables, seeds, beans, and legumes into their daily routine. Sadly, however, without the kitchen tools and support, very few end up sticking with it. So because adopting a plant-based diet transformed my life so profoundly and because I want everybody to experience some version of what I've experienced, we decided to tackle and solve this very common problem. The solution we've devised, I'm proud to say, is the Plant Power Meal Planner, our affordable all-in-one digital platform that sets you up for nutrition excellence by providing access to thousands of highly customizable, super delicious, and easy to prepare plant-based recipes. Everything integrates with automatic grocery delivery and you get access to our amazing team of nutrition coaches seven days a week and many other features. To learn more and to sign up, visit meals.richroll.com. And right now for a limited time, we're offering $10 off an annual membership when you use the promo code RRHealth at checkout. This is life-changing stuff, people, for just $1.70 a week, literally the price of a cup of coffee. Again, that's meals.richroll.com, promo code RRHealth for $10 off an annual membership. All right, let's get back to the show. Okay, and we're back. So we're gonna pivot to our brief conversation with Arctic swimmer, Lewis Pugh. We've talked about Lewis quite a bit on mm -hmm. the podcast, so I don't wanna spend too much time um, introducing him, but for those that are unfamiliar or new to this, Lewis is uh, an environmentalist. He is somebody who has spent the last 30 years exploring the world by swimming, particularly swimming in very cold sections of the planet. He just completed this swim in Greenland, uh, which was a world's first to draw attention to the melting, um, the melting glaciers there. And it's just the latest ice swim that he's done uh, to raise awareness for climate change. What else do we need to know about He's him? He's a Hall Adam. of Fame marathon swimmer. Um, he swam uh, across the North Pole. He swam, he's the first to do that. He, he's done the highest swim ever in a lake on Mount Everest. He, the, the, the polar swim before this one was swimming in a melting glacier in Antarctica, right. literally going inside a glacier and swimming in a glacial tunnel. Um, and just as you know, as always, swim cap, goggles, and what's and a swim a swimsuit like a speedo. Right. He's also a UN patron of the oceans. On on November fifth, on the fifth day of COP twenty six, he's going to be giving the opening address of the Youth and Oceans Day, mm -hmm. which is interesting. And he's really like 
an explorer in the very traditional sense of the word, right? Almost yeah. like out of a Wes Anderson movie, <laughs> like a guy who would be knighted, you know, right. and spend his time in the Explorers Club, you know, surrounded by wood paneling and all kinds of knickknacks from, you know, the heyday of humans exploring the far corners of the planet. Like in the, in, and I say that in the most, you know, kind of uh, congratulate, like sort of positive light. Yeah, he's, you know? he's erudite. He is, uh, he is diplomat. He has the he's diplomatic, a diplomatic. He's, he has a diplomat. Yeah. He's, you know, UN patron of the oceans, like you said, and, and um, he is a professional diplomat and he, he merges sports and diplomat and diplomacy. But um, he also has this burning red coal, Greta Thunberg energy inside him too. Right. Because he is, he is on a mission to try to save us from the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. And he is as driven to do that as you see any activist anywhere. So that's what's so yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Super intelligent um, and well-spoken on all of the issues. So uh, let's pivot to our conversation with him now. Rich, I... Uh... You know, myself and Adam tried to to pull this thing off where Adam would come to Greenland. Uh, Adam, I'm so sorry we weren't able to pull it off, but it's really an honor to be able to speak to both of you today. Thank you so much for giving me the time. Well, we're delighted to have you. We were, of course, disappointed that Adam couldn't figure out uh, with everything going on in the world how to get to Greenland, but we followed your expedition very closely. We're both big longtime fans. Um, I know that you have a, a, a pre-existing relationship with Adam and we're just delighted um, in lieu of being able to do this in person to at least uh, get you on a remote platform to help uh, share your work and, and your advocacy um, today. So you're now safely ensconced in, in, in Cape Town. So thank you for joining us today. I think the first thing we're, we're curious about is what drew you to Greenland this year? Like why Greenland? So walk us through how this expedition came together and your thinking behind it. Thank you so much. I mean, I've been swimming now for 35 years and the last 18 of those have been in the polar regions. And so I'm always looking for a place where I can tell a story about what is happening to these unique environments and how it will impact us wherever you are in the world. And I was drawn to Greenland because it now has the fastest moving glacier in the world. So the glacier is on the west coast of Greenland. It's called Ilulissat. Ilulissat is the Inuit name for place of icebergs. And it certainly is that. But this glacier now is moving at a speed of 40 meters per day in summer. Mm. So I just thought this this is a place where I can share now before the big climate change negotiations start next month. This is a place where I can share with the world what is happening. What is happening is that there's this uh, dramatic ice melt, right? And we saw it in your swim where uh, there were days you couldn't swim because there was so much ice kind of coming down the river and into the fjord. and. And uh, it was like you said, swimming across a, a motorway, but filled with icebergs. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so I want you to imagine uh, you've got the Greenland ice sheet, which is the second biggest ice sheet in the world. And on the edge, you go, uh, the, the ice sheet goes down valleys and becomes glaciers. And at the edge of the glacier, it is starting to carve and those carves into icebergs. And then for a a length of about 60 kilometers down this long field, you've got thousands and thousands and thousands of icebergs. And at the mouth of this field were a number of really big ones, a kilometer tall, it's astonishing. And they were grounded on the, uh, on the seabed. And so I was trying to swim on the outside of these icebergs across this field. And then at 4 a.m. one morning, I'll never ever forget it, I opened my curtains and I looked out and one of these enormous icebergs was beginning to rotate. So it was breaking up and it was rotating and it opened up the floodgates. And literally we had 60 kilometers worth of icebergs, thousands and thousands and thousands of them going straight out to sea. And within a few hours, they were 10 kilometers out to sea. By the next day, they had extended 50 kilometers to the north. Wherever you looked out at sea, there were just icebergs. There was no spare water anywhere, no clear water anywhere. And so then having to, in a few days time, uh, there were some areas where I could do the swim. But again, as soon as I got into the water, it was like a motorway of ice. 
I'm taking off my clothes. We've got a clear route to, to swim, but within a short period of time, now a big iceberg has moved in our way. I've never seen a carving event like this in my life. Mm. Yeah, I think for most of us, uh, intellectually, you know, we understand uh, global warming and climate change to be, you know, the existential, you know, threat of our time, but it's purely an academic exercise for most of us. I mean, we're now seeing, uh, warming events and, 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 you know, weather incidents that are making it much more experiential, but I think the power in your expedition and what you've just experienced is it really puts an exclamation point on the present reality of what our, what we're facing. And my sense is that, it was even worse than what you expected in, in that, you know, you didn't realize there was going to be this motorway of smaller icebergs to have to navigate. And that in truth, this scenario is, is, you know, far worse than, than, you know, what we might've imagined and much more present. And I think the narrative that comes out of your, your adventure uh, is really helping all of us to embrace that reality in a more fungible, tangible way. Yes, I mean, I agree with you. So we, we've all seen the horrendous fires which have been in California and in Turkey and in Greece and in, in Siberia. We've seen them on television and some people have, have witnessed them firsthand. And we've all seen the dreadful floods which occurred this year in, in, in Germany and in Belgium. And we've heard about the melting of the ice. But when you stand next to a field and you watch as thousands and thousands of icebergs literally are getting washed very quickly out to sea. And then when you go up onto the ice sheet and everywhere you see these, what we call supraglacial lakes. So these are meltwater lakes on top of the ice sheet. And what this does is that the, the water drills through the ice, it finds cracks, it goes all the way down to the bottom of the ice sheet of the bedrock, making this ice sheet more and more unstable. And this year, shortly before I started the swim, was the first time in recorded history that scientists recorded rain on the highest point in Greenland. And so you put all these things together, all these events which are happening all over the world and wildfires down in Australia and the bleaching of the coral reefs, you put them all together and it tells us a pattern about what is happening and it shows us what will happen unless we get a grip of this situation. Mm. You, uh, you know, just one thing that people might, if just for just to make it really clear every summer there is some melting of the ice sheet right just like their wildfires are not uncommon or um the king tide event we even saw here in malibu which took half the beach away i mean the beach in where we are often in where i do a lot of swimming is now half the size of i've ever seen it before i mean I, you were just there mm -hmm. at zuma and um how do you how do you like for people who aren't as familiar how do you parse what's normal and what's become augmented or extreme? Or is that just not something that's even worth discussing now? When you talk about the rain on Greenland, that's one thing. It's never happened before. But how do you how do you explain to people that what's happening is just a bigger version of the natural cycle and therefore it's dangerous? Yes. So you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, for time immemorial, uh, glaciers have carved icebergs and icebergs have gone out to, to sea. But it's the speed and the scale of the crisis, of the climate crisis, which is taking scientists by surprise. And just to give you a, a practical example, so we've been talking about ice, which is on land. Let me give you another example about ice, which is in the sea, so sea ice. Back in 2005, I did a swim in the Norwegian part of the Arctic, north of an island called Spitsbergen. And there in summer, the water was three degrees centigrade. I went back there 12 years later, the water wasn't three degrees centigrade. Now it was 10 degrees centigrade. Mm. So gone from three, 10 in just 12 years. And the scientists are telling me that is not normal. Mm -hmm. That is an impact of us simply warming the planet. Mm. Lewis, you mentioned that you've been doing these swims for over three decades at this point. I'm curious about the intersection of of your interest in environmentalism with your with your swimming, like which came first and how do they inform each other? Oh, uh, swimming came first, <laughs> swimming came first. So I had my proper swim, first proper swimming lesson very late in life when I was 17. Uh, I grew up in initially in Britain, but then uh, I moved out to Cape Town. 
And for those of your listeners who've been to Cape Town, it's just an incredible place because on the one side, you've got the Indian Ocean. On the other side, you've got the Atlantic Ocean. And my high school uh, history class looked out over the Atlantic Ocean. And in the distance, if I put my head out the window, I could see Robben Island. And um, I don't even know where the idea came from, but I just wanted to swim to this island. This was 1987. This was a time when Nelson Mandela uh, and, and many people were imprisoned in South Africa. Anyway, I got permission to do this swim and uh, uh, I barely made it. And uh, But afterwards, every single year, I've just tried to do another swim. It really grabbed me. I loved swimming so much. Um, and so every year I've done a bigger, harder, tougher, and inevitably colder swim. Uh, and then there was a time in the early 2000s where I began to notice how the oceans were really changing. So whether it be this, what was happening in the Arctic with the sea ice, or just seeing less fish in the world, or plastic all over our beaches. And then there came a time when I realized I had to stand up and talk about about what I was seeing in the world's oceans. Mm. And so tying the power of your swimming capabilities to activism has become like your advocacy and, and, and your passion. Um, what is your sense of, of impact with all of this? Like, are you encouraged by the results of, you know, getting out there and doing things that, you know, draw a lot of attention and interest in, in what you're doing? Like, how do we translate the inspiration that we can garner from your, you know, your, your, your epic swims into, you know, real, real change? It's really hard to, me to measure the impact. I mean, somebody may look at my swim and, and hopefully be inspired to protect uh, the environment in whichever area, you, you know, they, they operate in. So it's very, very hard to, to measure it. Uh, it's not like let's say selling shoes. You know, you know if you if you sell shoes, you know how many you sold at the end of each month and the end of each year, and you know when you're being successful. What I've concentrated on the last couple of years is creating what we call marine protected areas. And marine protected areas are like national parks, but they're in the sea. They pre prevent uh, overfishing in these areas. And uh, the big success came a few years ago, 2016 when I worked with John Kerry and a number of other people to help create a very, very big marine protected area down in Antarctica. Mm -hmm. uh, so that marine protected area is the size of Britain, France, Germany, Italy, all put together. It's the biggest protected area in the world. But, and you would have thought I'd be really happy about this, but I'm not, I'm, you know, we're now in a race against time. We're trying to create another three big marine protected areas around uh, Antarctica. And we're also working to try and get 30% of the world's oceans now protected by 2030. Mm. I think really interesting, some of the stuff that you've done, including like, I guess the last one before this, you were actually swimming in a melting glacier. Like you found a, a, a riverine glacial melt in Antarctica and you actually got inside a glacier and swam, uh, I guess, a kilometer inside this glacial river. Uh, and th that was uh, an incredible moment as well. And so you, you found these really interesting places to go. Um, but I, something that people may, might not know of is your partnership with Slava Fedosov, the, the hockey star in Russia. And I wanted to bring that up just because, you know, especially in America, we have this, you know, crazy kind of, uh, you know, black and white, uh, you know, Russia versus the United States thing that's been going on my entire life. But really, there's some really great environmentalists on both sides. Can you explain your partnership with him and how he was involved in Antarctica and just in general, how he's an ally in climate? Yeah, so Slava is a very special person. And for your listeners who don't know him, he used to be the captain of the former Soviet ice hockey team. Uh, and then he was the first Russian to come over and play professional uh, ice hockey in, in the United States of America. Um, the way I got to meet him was I was trying to get this area down in Antarctica protected called the Ross Sea. And under international law, 25 countries had to agree it. And one of those was Russia. Another of those was China. And all the countries agreed it except Russia and China. And no matter how many times, and it took 17 years that diplomats were going backwards and forwards trying to get these last two countries to agree it. Um, and they weren't able to, to, to agree it. It was President Obama's last term, and Obama was very passionate about creating marine protected areas. He sent John Kerry through to Beijing, and John was able to get the Chinese to agree it. 
But the last hurdle was obviously the Russians. And I just, it sounds crazy. I had this belief that if I could just go down there and do a swim in this place and show the beauty of it and show how magnificent it is and film the, the humpback whales and film the emperor penguins and all these other magnificent animals, this is their home. We need to protect it. This place was on the edge of being seriously overfished. If I could do that and I could go to Russia and meet with Russia's leadership, I hope that I could persuade them that we must protect this last great wilderness. But, you know, I'm half British and I'm half South African. I had no friends in Russia. But uh, somebody introduced me to Slava Fetisov. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, you know, Lewis, I'm a defense man. And the world needs more defenders and protectors. Do your swim, come here, and I'll introduce you to who you need to meet. So I went down there, I did the swim, I then immediately got on a plane and I flew from, from Cape Town through to, to Moscow, just not knowing what to expect. And I arrived there and there was Slava. You know, uh, Slava Fetisov in Russia is the biggest sporting name. Still, you know, he's, he's just turned 60, 61. He's still a huge name there, very, very influential. And he's a senator. And he took me literally from minister to minister to minister to the security minister, to the closest advisors to President Putin. And over a period of two years, I shuttled backwards and forwards to Washington. And then that day when Russia signed the deal, so the last country of the 25 countries to agree it, it was the mm. happiest day of both of our lives. Because mm. we realized that we need to talk to each other. We need to work together. These global problems cannot be solved just by America or just by Britain. You know, Russia is a country and it operates in 11 time zones. You go from Vladivostok all the way to St. Petersburg, it's 11 time zones. It owns half the Arctic. It's got huge natural resources. You think of China, what a massive country China is, and India. We cannot solve these big global problems, whether it be climate change, overfishing, pollution, any of these, without all these countries working together. And that's why these environmental diplomats are so important, mm. because they're able to work together and listen to the dialogue of the other side. Yeah, and with that, we're on the cusp of, of COP26 in, in Glasgow. Uh, I, th I think you're attending that. Like, what is your hope for what may transpire there? Yeah, well, my, my hope for COP26 is that finally we realize that we're in the last chance, that we really are. So what I saw in Greenland in terms of the melting was, was so worrying, very, very, very worrying. And I, I, I want to bring my message about what I've seen there and bring it to Glasgow. You know, ice is essential for life on Earth because what ice does, it keeps our planet within a temperature range in which we can live. And I always say to politicians, no ice, no life. If we allow the polar regions to melt and we allow the glaciers and the Himalayas to melt, we will not be able to survive. Ice is as important as the air we breathe. And I'll go there with a, with a message, please. We cannot have these commit. I, I cringe whenever I hear a world leader make a commitment for 2050 and 2060, which a lot of them are making now. There's no political leader or business leader in the world that won't make a commitment for 2050, 2060. And we know perfectly well they won't be around there to deliver on it. We need shorter commitments. But not only the commitment, we now need action. Mm -hmm. The time for talking, talking is important. Getting consensus is important, but the time for action is right now. Yeah, my, it, it, it seems that the gravamen of the conversation is around slowing this process down. We had uh, Paul Hawken on the show the other week, and he said, he said, nobody gets up in the morning excited about mitigation, right? <laughs> we need to be talking about drawdown, like reversing this. We need to you know, invest in these regenerative solutions. And yet from a political perspective, that becomes problematic. And the safest route is always to talk about, you know, this mitigation idea or how we can reduce these emissions as opposed to really, you know, in my opinion, over invest in the solutions that will be most impactful in terms of, of drawdown and this idea of regeneration. Well, the interesting thing is that if we miss the time now, so if we allow, you know, just to put this in perspective, we're going into what's called UN COP26. 
So COP26 means there have been 26 of these conferences. They've lasted 27 years. Okay. So a large portion of the world's population were not alive when we started these negotiations to try and put a halt to the climate crisis. Okay. And if we miss this opportunity, and if it's just a talking shop, then no amount of political goodwill, no amount of technology, which you talk about, no amount of investment is going to be able to solve this crisis because you pass, as a scientist say, certain tipping points. And there are a number of scientists who believe we have already passed some tipping points in terms of the Greenland ice sheet. If the whole Greenland ice sheet were to melt, melt, that's a seven meter sea level rise Mm. that impacts everybody. Yeah, we... we, um... We've seen the floods, like you said, in Europe. We saw floods in New York City. It even it wasn't even a hurricane, and it caused the catastrophic floods, uh, killed dozens of people. Um, we've seen these climate events happen. Um, in Greenland, originally, you were thinking of uh, a, a bigger swim, of swimming the entire length of of what has receded, what a part of the ice sheet that's already melted. Correct. What was that? What was that number again? How like since from the beginning of the cops from 27 years ago? Yeah, so initially, you know, you're, I, I'm, I've always got an atlas opening in my office and I'm always looking at and thinking to myself, where can I do a swim here that's going to highlight an issue, be it pollution, be it climate change, be it overfishing? Where can I do a swim? And, you know, creativity is, is not an aha moment. It's an adieu moment. It means, ah, why did I not see this great swim? And so there was a moment when I thought, wow, why don't I go to Greenland and do a swim in a Lulasat and start where the glacier is was 27 years ago and swim all the way to where it is today? Uh, that was a bit naive mm. of me because there's so much ice pouring down it's literally like a wall of ice, so much ice now coming down uh, that, that 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 swim wouldn't have been possible. So as soon as I got there, I realized that I had to swim across it rather than do something like that, which would have been, frankly, would have been a lot easier to tell as a media story. Um, you know, this is where the glacier was 27 years ago, and there it is all the way up there now. Yeah. It, it's several kilometers, right? Or right. several miles? Oh, well, uh, since a hundred years ago, it's gone over 60 kilometers. Wow. So it's, uh, it's, it's receded an awful lot. And as I said, at the moment now it's receding. Um, so it's moving at a speed of, uh, 40 meters per day in summer. That's crazy. It's truly astonishing. Yeah. You know, the, the, the other thing that you, you notice when you're up right next to the glacier as it's carving, is just how much water there is. There are waterfalls coming on the side. So you've got water coming from the side you got water coming underneath, as I talked about those, those lakes on the top. You've got water draining through and coming out. It is a very, very dynamic situation there right now. And remember, this is just one glacier on the west coast of Greenland. Mm. But this is happening in many glaciers around mm. the world, in the Arctic, in the Antarctic, and obviously in the mountainous regions. And the mountainous regions are another scenario altogether. And the reason for that is because those glaciers provide a constant water supply. Yeah. So you think about the glaciers in the Himalayas, they provide water to India, to China, to Bangladesh, to Burma, to Pakistan. People need water. Water is essential for life on earth. And as those glaciers retreat, as they melt away, there goes that water supply. Mm. So those areas then become a cocktail for conflict. Mm. People need to move to water. Mm. You had mentioned that the Greenland swim was among, if not the hardest swim that you that you had done. Walk us through the experience of of getting in that water. I, I guess it was around zero Celsius, correct? And how you kind of trained and prepared yourself to endure that, and what it actually felt like when you were, you know, in 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 that frigid cold. Uh. Rich the water is so cold. So <laughs> it, it, it ranged between <laughs> it ranged between zero and three degrees. And um, swimming in cold water is the only sport in the whole world that the more experience you have, the harder it wow. becomes. <laughs> and the reason for that is so I don't know, let's just say you're playing tennis. 
the more balls you hit, the easier it becomes. It, well, it should. Okay. With, with cold water swimming, the more you do, the harder it becomes. And that is because when you've been really, really, really cold, you never forget it. It's deep down in your bones. And then so every single subsequent you swim you're going to do, you have to forget about what happened there. I had to forget about that swim in 2007 when I swam across the North Pole. I had to forget the panic when I was swimming down in the Ross Sea or gasping for air in a glacial lake on Mount Everest. You've got to forget it and you've got to be ready for the new swim. So the training package was a long package. I then did the acclimatization in Iceland and then you arrive in Greenland. And now I'm going to get into the water. And as I slowly lower myself down that ladder, it's just, it's just incredibly cold. And uh, uh, early in the morning, I've taken a temperature capsule. And what that does is it tells my doctor on the, on the boat exactly what's happening inside me real mm -hmm. time. And the astonishing thing happens that when I lower myself into really cold water, actually my core body temperature rises. So it rises from normal core body temperature, which is about 37 up to 38. And then I normally swam for about 10 minutes. And during that time, my core body temperature maintained the same level and on some occasions even increased. But then when I get out and the cold blood in my arms and legs returns to my core, mm. then my core body temperature drops. And so then it's quickly into a sleeping bag and then a hot water, three hot water bottles, hot chocolate, and it would take me between two and two and a half hours to rewarm after mm. each of those swims. And I was doing it twice a day. So after I'd finished my first swim, I'd recovered, I'd eaten a bit of lunch, then back in again for the mm. second session. It was unrelenting and it was brutal. So 10 minute swims, it takes two hours plus to warm up from a 10 minute swim. Unbelievable. Yeah. And, and you're yeah. in. And you know, in, 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 and in the old days, I just used to dive in. I used to dive in, I used to swim as fast and as quick as I could, get out, get into a hot shower. We, we tried that in some of the training. That is the worst possible thing you could do. <laughs> the science now is quite clear. You need to lower yourself. You need to be able to control your breathing, not have what they call the cold shock response. And then once you're ready, get going. And then swim as fast and as hard as you can. Swimming is also the only sport in the world which operates on three axes. So your head moves left to right, your arms move around and around, your legs move up and down. And if any one of those is not in sync, you're going to be fighting the sea. Well, I can tell you something, when you jump into zero degree water, things are not necessarily in sync. And so there's this, you're fighting when you're in, the, in that type of water. It's a struggle. It's a, you're constantly thinking about the pain. And on the side of the boat, I've got my team counting me. They're giving me, they're giving me my stroke counts. If I'm going at 30 strokes a minute, they're happy. If I go up to 34, they ask me to slow down. If I'm down at 25, they say, if you don't speed up, you're going to be out very, very soon. So it's a constant communication with my team to be able to get me through each of these swims. Mm -hmm. I mean, given that no matter how much you do it, it never gets easier. There's nothing that you really truly can do to, to acclimatize yourself or, or normalize the experience. Why even train in, you know, ahead of time to get ready? Is that just to figure out how to communicate with your team and to get all the kind of data points so that they can ensure that you're safe? Or what was your thinking with all of those swims leading up to Greenland? No, no, actually the acclimatization is absolutely essential. If I didn't do that, um, no, I don't think I'd be able to survive. The water is so extreme. Water is also a fascinating substance, uh, Rich. So obviously between zero and 100, it's a liquid. Above 100, it changes, it becomes a gas. Below zero, it changes from a liquid to a solid. So there's actually a tipping point at which everything changes. And it's the same inside you. So when you're swimming in water around zero, and sometimes I've done swims below zero degrees centigrade. So when I swam down the Ross Sea, and when I swam at the North Pole, the water was minus 1.7. Mm -hmm. So salt water gets even colder. And when you're in that water, it is, you are on, you're definitely, you're on the edge of life and death. No question about that. So having done the preparation, having done some of the acclimatization, uh, it helps, it helped hugely, but there's only so much you can do. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be able to acclimatize and make it feel comfortable swimming in the Arctic day after day. And at the end of the swim, so it was 14 days of swimming. I remember on the, on the last day, I was just about to lower myself down the ladder. 
and I'm just wearing swimming trunks, right? My team are in three or four layers of clothing. And I looked at them and I was really happy because this was the final swim and I wouldn't have to wake up in the morning and get back in amongst the icebergs. But all of them were shivering. So everybody on the boat was cold. And I realized that, you know, for 14 days, I had been absolutely frozen. Wow. You literally had ice water in your veins. Yeah. <laughs> um, the... the uh... The uniform is obviously the open water swimming uniform that you've kept true to, even though you could have done these extreme events and, and nobody, or these extreme swims and nobody would have batted an eye if you wore a, even a three mil wetsuit or a seven mil wetsuit. Um, but you're keeping to the marathon, you're a member of the hall of fame of marathon swimming. You're keeping to the marathon swimming, just a speedo swim cap and goggles, right? Sure. And, and I mean, it's for a few reasons. So. Clearly, I'm trying to get attention mm -hmm. to these areas and to the issue of, of the climate crisis. And you know perfectly well that if you swim across the North Pole in a pair of Speedos, a cap and goggles, the world's media are going are gonna to follow you. Um, you know, as I, was, as I was arriving at the North Pole, I remember as I had a satellite phone on, on the boats, you know, there was Jay Leno was calling me, you know, lots of, of, of big names were calling me. I realized that that the world's eyes were on me. This was the first time in human history that the North Pole had properly unfrozen. Uh, if I was able to do a swim there, it would carry a very, very powerful message. So that's the wrong, one reason why I wear just a pair of Speedos. But, but the other one is more fundamental, and that is the decisions which world leaders have to make now are hard, they are complex, and they require courage. Because with that, we're asking them to make decisions now and the benefits will be felt in a few years time. And I'm urging world leaders to be courageous because if we don't do that, we're gonna be in a, an incredibly difficult situation in a few years time. Mm. And if I'm asking for them to be courageous, I also felt that I should be courageous. And we felt that swimming in a dry suit or a wetsuit wouldn't send the right message. What about a swim mask? Have you considered a swim mask? There's a whole inside <laughs> joke about this. <laughs> <laughs> I can, I can answer for him. Yeah, <laughs> see see what I'm saying, Adam? Adam goes out into the ocean and he I refuses wear, to wear goggles. He wears a swim mask. I, wear, I keep giving I him shit about it because I, I don't understand. You, you, like, please just it's like don a pair of proper the, goggles. Your neighbor, the octopus teacher guy. Yeah. He, uh, I don't know how close of a neighbor is he are. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Like, yeah, like, like a dinosaur. Yeah, yeah. he doesn't even know what it okay, is. Okay, so you got much... <laughs> So you got much more visibility. I mean, I just wear, wear these things just, I don't know why, just it's what I've always worn. <laughs> okay. um, well, you've been very generous with your time, but I, I, I can't let you go uh, as we kind of wrap this up without um, um, asking you if you have any advice for listeners or viewers who are inspired by what you've done, who feel compelled to participate in positive, meaningful change. What is your best suggestions in terms of how people can get more involved in climate change issues? What is the single best thing that they can do to help? Uh, a, a few things, P please. Uh, I, I can't drill it down to one, but we need to become environmentally literate. We really do. We need to understand the issues and wherever I go in the world, you know, even speaking to heads of state or, or business leaders, it, it becomes quite clear to me that they don't understand all the environmental issues. We need to become on top of them like we have with, for example, pandemics in the, in the last year, year and a half. I think the second thing is we are way past the time when we can be quiet on this issue. This is a defining issue of our lifetime. And the third thing is what can ordinary people do? Every single decision which we make, every single purchase which we make on a daily basis is a decision about our future. It's a decision about our children and the whole of the animal kingdom. And whether that be the clothes we wear, the food we eat, uh, how we get to school, how we get to work, uh, how we invest any money which we may have, spare money which we may have, every single one of those decisions is a decision about our future. And I just ask everybody to be really cognizant on a daily basis of those decisions. Because if we always choose the environmentally friendly decision or choice, then multiplied over 7.9 billion people, which is the world's population, that makes a really big mm -hmm. difference. Mm. Yes, it really is up to us. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The idea and of being self-empowered. 
in and, this process. And that's what's so good about us being able to come together and talk about the environmental issues and the climate over and over again as we, you know, to build the environmental mm -hmm. literacy. So, you know, it's, it's, you're, you're so eloquent always, Lewis, and you're a, an incredible diplomat for the oceans. It's really a uh, pleasure to, to speak with you. I, I, I so wanted to be one of those people huddled up and shivering on the boat while you had to get in the water. Um, but, uh, but this is the next best thing. I, would, I wouldn't have allowed you. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't have allowed you. You'd have had to come in the water. I would have been in there. <laughs> hey, um, you said you're done with ice swimming. You said that on your Instagram that you think you're done. You think you're retired. How sure are you about that? Very. <laughs> <laughs> but not a hundred percent. Well, yeah, not, not, not 100%, but, uh, as I say, I've been doing this for 15 years. And in, in some cases, I've, I've literally felt like a voice in the wilderness, mm -hmm. actually in the wilderness. And uh, I love swimming. I want to swim until the last day of my life. You know, when I'm, when, when I'm swimming, the world feels perfect. I love at the end of the day, running down into the ocean and running down the beach and taking off my clothes and jumping in the sea. And those first 10, 20 strokes is, is heaven. And I'll continue to swim. But swimming in, in the polar regions, which is so incredibly dangerous and which is so all-consuming, uh, I, I think it's going to be a new generation that uh, I hope will take up the baton and be a voice for the polar regions and how important they are. I'll keep on swimming. I'll be swimming in some of the warmer parts of the world. I'll still be talking about overfishing, climate change, plastic pollution, which is so endemic all over the world. I'll keep on swimming until my last mm. day. Well, the world is certainly better with you swimming in it. As Adam said, you are a phenomenal champion of our precious waterways. And my only regret in this experience today is that we couldn't do it in person. So if you find yourself in Los Angeles, uh, open invite to come to the studio and we'll go deep and long. And if I find myself in, in Cape Town or wherever else you may be, uh, I would love to meet you in person and uh, continue the conversation, but appreciate you tuning in today, Lewis, and best of luck to you. Thank you both so much. It's been a real honor. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Adam, what did you think? You know, I always love talking to Lewis. He is, uh, you know, he brings it every time. I always learn something from mm -hmm. him. Yeah, what a beautiful human. Um, I think we can all learn quite a bit from his example. And again, this is a guy who's been doing it for 30 years. And to you know, maintain that level of not only enthusiasm, but uh, integrity and commitment to um, communicating his perspective, you would think that someone who's been at it for that long would become jaded and maybe deep down he is, but the manner in which he carries himself as this statesman diplomat, I think is, um, is really powerful. The eight, last 18 years in polar regions, you know, mm -hmm. like, I mean, and I love what he said about, he opens up the Atlas to like right. kind of look for like the, the next, the next project. And you know, he's doing that already. Right. Well, there was a map behind him <laughs> yeah. on the wall the whole time. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you saw that. And he had that polar bear statue. And yeah, he did. <laughs> um, but I love what he said about environmental literacy, building environmental literacy and how that's kind of a responsibility we should all take on. Mm -hmm. And uh, so kudos to you for doing that, for doing that for so long in relation to climate with, you know, Paul Hawken and, and then even stuff that we do when it, when it becomes kind of part of the news cycle, even when it's not, we often bring it up. But then um, also when it comes to plant-based, I mean, that's a big driver in your conversation, usually sure. around plant-based eating, because you know he, he spoke to individual choice as a, a, a major thing people can do. Yeah, I think the environmental literacy piece is huge, but the caveat that I would offer on that topic is, is the fact that literacy without action is, is feckless. And what I mean by that is, you know, when, I, when I'm thinking about that, I'm reminded of something that Paul Hawkins said, which is that um, there's no difference between uh, someone who is incredibly climate literate and somebody who is a climate change denier if they're not actually doing anything. Yeah, right. Right. So the important thing is finding a manner in which you can plug into the solution and, and, and that thing being the thing that excites you, which again, uh, harkens back to, you know, what Paul Hawken had to say, like find the thing that gets you excited in the morning. There's so many things, pick up Paul's book, Regeneration, which is rife with 
all manner of solutions. Find the thing that excites you a little bit and determine a manner in which you can participate in that. Um, and I think a way to do that is even if you don't have his new book, you can go to Paul's website, regeneration.org, and he's got uh, a function on there called Nexus. And if you click that, I think it's regeneration.org slash Nexus if you wanna go direct. Um, and that's a way to learn more about the various ways in which you can participate. But Beautiful. yeah, it begins with literacy, but literacy um, must be followed up with the action. Yeah, I mean, and 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 I think Paul Hawken and and Lewis Pugh, they're kind of two sides of the same coin, right? Mm -hmm. Like one is on the diplom, one is kind of doing grassroots education work, and the other one is doing kind of uh, red alert. Right. Exploration, activism, and diplomacy at the highest levels. So. Yeah. And they've both been doing it for decades. Yeah. I mean, amazing to have those mm -hmm. guys. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's switch gears for a minute here. Um, in in kind of thinking about what we wanted to talk about today, Adam and I, as as you guys may know, we kind of toss back ideas throughout the week. We work on an outline and in switching gears right now, uh, we're gonna try another thing that's a little bit new rather than taking something from the news cycle to dive deep into. I wanted to uh, telescope out a little bit um, because I've been thinking a lot about this podcast, what I wanna say with it and what I want it to be about in general, especially since I'm coming up on on the, the the ninth anniversary of doing this. This is the 631st episode. Hmm. And if you think about that in two hour chunks, that's what, you know, over 1200 hours of talking. So what are we doing here? You know, I mean, people always ask me, what have you learned? How does all the information get processed in your head? What are the biggest takeaways? And like I said, I have been spending a little bit more time devoted to thinking about that because I, I've always felt like I didn't really have a very good answer. And that this process of self-inquiry really was catalyzed or prompted by dint of, of my visit to Minneapolis this past spring. And I've told this story prior, but just to briefly recap, when Black Lives Matter was erupting and Derek Chauvin was on trial for murder of George Floyd and Minneapolis was on the precipice of burning, it was a moment in time in which everybody had opinions about what was right, what was wrong, what was happening. And you know, I certainly did. Um, but we made this choice as a team to, uh, to, to actually visit, like go to the place. And, and rather than form you know, our takes based on other people's opinions or our siloed news feeds to instead like go there and create a perspective that was informed by direct experience rather than the news cycle. And, towards that end to engage with community leaders from people on the front lines, you know, all the way to the actual, you know, mayor. And that was really fueled by this sense of, of curiosity to engage in conversation and, and premised upon this idea that is fundamental to the podcast here, which is that conversation matters. Like it really does matter. And the most impactful exchange that, that, that I had over the course of that trip wasn't with the mayor, it wasn't with the city councilmen or any of the civic leaders that we, that we sat down with, but instead was with this average citizen, this neighborhood watch volunteer in George Floyd Square, who in the course of conversation on the street and this person like wondering who I was and curious about my motives for being in George Floyd Square asked me this question, that turns out was quite profound and not what I was expecting, which was, what does your podcast do? He literally said, what does your podcast do? Mm. And it seems kind of funny, like usually it would be like, what is your podcast or what do you talk about or tell me about it? But something about that phraseology, like what does your podcast do really forced me to think about an answer because I didn't have an answer in the moment. Um, and I still struggle with trying to answer, answer that question, but I think that I'm starting to arrive at some sense of, of what that answer or those answers are. And I think in the most general sense, um, the podcast is like this signal for change. It's a signal for the positive change that I've experienced in this sense that like whatever I've experienced is available to other people, like this hopefulness. 
um, and the positive change that I believe we're all capable of, of manifesting as individuals, as citizens, as a global collective. And you know, thinking about that makes me think about the audience and this idea of putting that question on yourselves. Like, who are all of you? Like, what does your work do? What does your curiosity do? What does your life do? Like, what do you do? And I'm not talking about your job. I'm talking about like you, like, what are you doing? Like, can you answer that question in your own life? Like, Adam, what are you doing? Like, like, what are you doing? Not much. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, what is the thing, man? Like, what are you up to in, like, the, why, in the broadest sense? Like, listen, man, you're taking up a lot of oxygen. What are you doing with it? Exactly. Uh, I know. Um, and it's kind of like midlife crisis inspiring stuff. It, it, that you're it is sort at. of. You, yeah, like yeah. We're treading into that territory because you can overthink your life. And there's something to be said for you know, doing what's, you know, doing what's on your plate, like doing what's in front of you. Because for me, I feel like best in my life when I'm kind of on a mission or whatever, but that doesn't mean that's what I should be doing or am doing. It's just a way to engage your mind in a, in a way. I don't know. I mean, you know, a lot of people, the, the yogis would say, what you're doing is you're here to learn and grow as a human being, you know, like mm -hmm. that is the deal. But of course, we also have all these crazy tragedies kind of seemingly unfolding in real time all around us. And so is that enough to like, to navel gaze? Probably not. So, um, you know, it's a good question. I mean, if you ask me, what am I doing um, when it comes to my work? Um, the, the best, I've had three times where I feel like there was meaning, like what I'm doing like affects the world in a positive way. Um, not during the activism of four, four things, not necessarily through activism. One was planting trees, very simple. Trees matter, we need more trees. Mm -hmm. I did that for a living for three years. The um, other was when I was doing Lonely Planet stuff, I hyped up this small roadside pad thai stand that like ended up becoming this huge thing as Lonely Planet drives so much traffic and they've made a lot of money and put their kids in better schools and that's great. Uh, the third thing is, the work with David Goggins. And the fourth thing is this work with you. And mm -hmm. that's where those are tangible feedback I'm getting from the world or obvious like with trees. So, you know, like other than that, you know, on a daily basis, um, what what does your life do? I don't know, I take a much more Zen Taoist approach and and uh, I try not to think about that. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's it's tough, you yeah. know, it's so esoteric. I mean, but I think there is, and, and I'm somebody who hasn't, you know, likewise, who hasn't been super directed in that. But I think there is something to be said for for indulging in that thought experiment. Yeah. Because whatever comes up will allow you to be a little bit more directed in terms of where you focus your attention. And, you know, if you were to ask me even, you know, not that long ago, like, what is your podcast? He's like, I have me, I have, I have conversations with people that interest me. And that's right. kind of it. You know, right. like I never really probed it any more deeply than that. But you know, anniversaries, middle age, or having been somebody who's been doing this for nine years, like you start to think like, well, what are we actually doing here? Right. Like, why am I spending so much time on this? Like, maybe I should be a little bit more thoughtful and intentional about how I'm approaching this work and trying to find ways to, you know, hopefully make it more meaningful for the audience rather than just indulgent. And so in that process of rumination, um, I've, I've arrived at, uh, a collection of things right now. It's six things. And that's a list that may grow longer. Um, a list I'm iterating on and, and that I'm kind of using as the basis for writing this. The, the prompt was really like, I'm being asked to go out and do more public speaking. And I have a keynote that I've delivered over the years. And it's really about like my journey. It's about me. It's about my story. It's about personal transformation and addiction and plant-based nutrition and all of that and the athletic accomplishments. But that feels like expired mm. on, on some level. Like I understand it has value and, and you know, people enjoy hearing that story and it is part of who I am. But I've done all of this other work since then that has not been part of how I communicate with audiences on stage and I really wanted to figure out how to how to make sense of the podcast in terms of what can be conveyed in a keynote type situation 
Um, so I've been actively, you know, engaged in trying to extract principles that I've learned over the years doing the podcast that might be helpful to audiences and, mm-hmm. and, and making it relevant. So that's kind of what's, you know, motivated me to be, think about all this kind of stuff. And I thought it would be cool on Roll On to drip these ideas out over the upcoming months, like doing one at a time. So the one that I wanna talk about today, the focus of this is, is, is curiosity. Curiosity being a principle that has driven um, my enthusiasm for doing the podcast in the first place and something that I think is, is part and parcel of every interesting person that I've ever sat across over the years. And the principle really is that life expands in lockstep with the extent to which you invest in your own personal curiosity. Meaning that curiosity isn't this God-given disposition. Oh, he's curious, she isn't. It's not a personality trait. It's more like meditation or training or education. It's a practice, it's a habit. It's something that is abundant and something that grows in proportion to your commitment to cultivating it. And when you exercise it, in my experience and in observing other people who invest in curiosity, I have noticed that it will dramatically expand the aperture of your life experience by putting you in much closer contact with new people, new ideas, new opportunities, adventures, practices, relationships that hold the potential to irrevocably and positively alter the trajectory of your life. I think what happens is people confuse passion with curiosity. You know, people ask me all the time, like, how do I figure out what my passion is? Or I need to be living a life of passion. You hear that all the time, like pursue your life of passion. Um, but And I think a lot of people are not connected to their passion mm. and, it makes them feel bad about themselves. Like all these people are out here pursuing their passion. Like, I don't even know what my passion is. And you kind of feel lousy like, or guilty, like I should know and I don't. Or that your job is supposed to be connected to it it, And I understand that, like I'm very empathetic to that. And I've been that person for many, many years. And the way out of that is to forget about all of that. And instead think of it in terms of curiosity, ask yourself, what is it that you're curious about? And it doesn't have to be any big deal. It could be some video you saw on YouTube that piqued your interest and some and and promoted, you know, prompted you to like look more deeply into something. So I think it's about awareness and presence of mind to notice your curiosity as it naturally percolates up and then having the wherewithal to see that and say, "Oh, there's a little spark of curiosity. Yeah. Maybe I should, you know, recognize that and honor that by going a little bit more deeply." And I think Developing that habit, just like a muscle that you build, will lead you to places you perhaps can't really predict right now. I like that idea. You know? I mean, you know, like the, the idea, because I think for most people, curiosity is kind of like part of the uh, firmware. You know what I mean? It's like it's like in there, but you don't really call it out as an individual thing. I mean, what you're doing is you're saying, we all have that quality somewhere in us. Um, not everybody is exercised, like you said, and, mm-hmm. and, but but to even recognize it as a quality that you have intrinsically in itself does a lot, right? It allows you to focus on, you know, just asking yourself the question, the power that comes with that, um, that comes out of, you know, what am I curious about versus just kind of following your curiosity unconsciously, mm-hmm. right? You're saying, make it a conscious choice, not an unconscious thing. Um, I do think smartphones can get in the way of it. You know, like, cause then you're, f- you're fed content. Yeah. Stuff pops up for you. Yes, curiosity might take you left, swiping left or right. That's not what you're talking about. You're talking about a deeper uh, inquiry within yourself. I think that this, this media saturated, content saturated environment we all live in um, kind of is anathema to what you're talking about. So there would be, uh, you know, a turning off one to kind of turning on the other aspect to this, I think. I think that's where curiosity starts to tiptoe into imagination. Mm-hmm. And they're certainly, you know, kindred, but they're different things. Uh-huh. I think what you're talking about is really about imagination. And you need that open, quiet space to indulge that. 
I think curiosity is about directing the imagination. And I think the smartphone can be a tool. It's okay. just about your relationship to the smart. Like, okay, I'm curious about this. The, the smartphone is a vehicle for learning more about a particular thing. It's just a question of whether you're in command of it or whether it's in command of you um, and recognizing what that relationship looks like. Um, and I just think that, 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 you know, when people say like, I don't know what my passion is, it's like, I can't, I, I don't know how to help that person. I can't tell you what your passion is, but I do know that you can't find your passion or your purpose or find meaning or fulfillment in life without consistently plying curiosity. And that just begins with those questions that you're asking yourself, what are you curious about? Mm. And I think curiosity is something that you're correct, is innate within all of us, but it needs to be called out consciously. It needs to be developed. It needs to be nurtured and cherished. And it begets itself. Like the more you invest in it, the more curiosity you have. Well, look at Davey's running journey, right? right. Yeah, he's curious about what he can do and that look what he's doing. And that opens up more questions. Wait, well, what, if I can do a half marathon in 133, Mm -hmm. you know, how fast can I run it? Right. You know, or- But behind it all, what's really going on is if I train for a half marathon, then I can give my excuse to buy a bunch of running, <laughs> cool running shoes. If I train for a marathon, then I can continue, oh, I can double down. His sneaker, his yeah. sneaker Jones. It's the hype beast <laughs> addiction <laughs> rearing its head, shrouded in this healthy pursuit yeah, yeah. of marathon glory. <laughs> the sneaker. The I jest, yeah. but it's true, you know, that, it's yeah. true. And I think, yeah, it's, it's this idea of not needing to know the destination. It's just about respecting the spark and following it. And part of the fun or the allure is not knowing all the answers or what the next step is and just opening yourself up to possibilities. Where do you think this like connects to beginner's mind? You know, cause I always think people who stay young are the ones that wanna learn another language or right. do something di different or, or like start square sure. one in some skill. I mean, Here, curiosity is a part of that, Of right? course, I mean, yeah. a perfect example would have been, would be Mary Kane doing the bike leg on the marathon mm -hmm or the Malibu triathlon this past weekend, like she's not an experience. She, she's always, Alexi was explaining this really well, saying that Mary is somebody who has always been the best and stays with the thing that she's best at. Like she's just an incredible runner, right? And the cycling piece has been an opportunity for the first time in a very long time for this person to have that, to like engage the beginner's mind, to be a beginner. And what I saw was somebody who who was really f like joyful mm. in that process. When you let go of like, I need to know, like what are people thinking or any, and like let go of all of that and just allow yourself to like go on this exploration to learn something new, to like have fun. You know, she didn't even have like a proper cycling kit. Like she's an elite athlete, didn't yeah. even have like a proper cycling kit. It didn't matter. It was about like, we're having fun. I don't know what I'm doing. Like I got a flat and I had to get the Tokyo gold medalist to fix my bike before I could e even ride it. And like, that's beautiful. Yeah. Right. There's like, a, there's a joy, a release in mm -hmm. the curiosity, right? When you start to pursue yeah. it. Yeah. So the message is to really, you know, bring that into your conscious awareness, this idea of curiosity and to really be conscious of discontinuing that proclivity or predisposition that so many of us have to build that wall of security and comfort around yourself, right? To rediscover the childlike mind of, of the inquisitor, to ask yourself what's left to discover and, and to really, you know, invest in discovering things that you want to know because it's curiosity that really holds the answer. I thought it killed the cat. Yeah. I don't know about that. Yeah, I don't know. Who came up with that? Some cat that hater. A curious George thing too. A dog person. Curiosity <laughs> killed the cat. A dog person. Killed like what a terrible <laughs> message to be put into some ch you know children's young person's thing. Like yeah. shaming people for their curiosity. Well, it was more like probably to keep people safe. Like don't go out there. Don't right. go in here. You know. Curiosity killed the cat. Yeah. That's a horrible thing to say. It is horrible. Don't be curious. Right. Be very afraid. It's like I, we were watching uh, Romeo and Juliet, the Baz Luhrmann version, uh -huh. and uh, I was just thinking that I could I could make a living on on TikTok just like if I could just give certain characters uh, some advice at crucial moments, 
Mm -hmm. like all the best literature would be gone, but these characters would survive. So give me an example. Well, like for instance, Juliet, you've only gone out with him twice. I mean, both in the same (laughs) night. You meet him, you meet him at the fish tank Uh um, in the movie, right? in, in the play, there was no fish tank, but you meet him at the party and then you have your moment and then he comes later to your balcony so I'm gonna give you two dates. It's probably one date, but I'll give you two dates. And then the next day, like you meet, up, you meet up with him again, only for the second time or third time, and you're supposed to marry the guy? Right. Like that's bad, that's, 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 that's not right. good parenting. I think this, <laughs> what I'm hearing here is curiosity leading you to building a viral TikTok <laughs> account of you breaking down great literature. <laughs> I know it's how bad and the talking choices are. sense. Poor choices. Like I know we all have decided that Romeo and Juliet is a work of <laughs> is a masterwork of genius, but let's like really break this down and analyze like how prudent these choices really are. Really bad choices. <laughs> yeah. um, Relationship advice in Shakespeare. Like like I'm curious. I have this idea for all, and I've been afraid to pitch you. But what if we just sat around and talked about our deepest regrets? Mm. <laughs> I thought I I thought that's what the show was already about. <laughs> No, I have this idea though for my Twitter because the Twitter is just kind of out there. It's like mm-hmm. fumbling. I'm curious. I would like to listeners to weigh in. Should I turn it in just to a reading Twitter account? Like what I've read five days a week, that's it. Something I've read. Or should I just leave it as this grab bag of nothing? I don't know. I think I think you I think you should try new things. Try I think you things. should try it out. Yeah. All right. Why not? That or sport, like some sporting news thing. What should it be? Books no, or? don't do that. All right. Curiosity killed the cat. Yeah, I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it should just be, I think it should be hot takes on Shakespeare. Hot, hot takes on uh, poor choices in, <laughs> yeah. in, our, in, our, in, our, in our canon of great literature. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Is that what you meant by your curiosity? Did uh, I screw it up? I don't, listen, man, wherever your curiosity takes you, it took us to- Curiosity empowers the cat. Uh, we, we volunteered at a, at a marine rescue, wildlife rescue mm-hmm. up the street from you. And we fed and helped clean up after uh, beach sea lions. And we did all that kind of stuff. And that was based on just pure curiosity. Like there's no, like we volunteered for a whole season mm-hmm. doing that. Um, was one of the best experiences I've ever had. Um, I think you're right. I mean, I think there's a lot, a lot to it. It's potent. Yeah. Good. Well, there we have it. Curiosity. Curiosity. This is the title of this podcast. Curiosity did not kill the cat. No, not yet. Curiosity expanded the cat's awareness. Curiosity is the cat. There you go. There is no cat. (laughs) There is no cat. All right, we're devolving. Let's uh, let's get to listener questions so we can get out of here. Yeah, let's do it. We're going to San Francisco for the first one. Hi, Rich and Adam. This is Hadar from San Francisco. Thank you for the wonderful podcast. I love listening to it on long runs. I'm calling to ask a question about getting into triathlon or multi-sport from the swimming side. Uh, I'm a semi-retired marathon swimmer beginning to get into multi-sport. And what I see around me are triathletes who get into the sport as seasoned runners and bikers. And my sense is that swimming is qualitatively different than the two other sports. And I wanted to ask if you had any advice. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, Yes and no in terms of difference. I think that you're in a fantastic situation in terms of pivoting to multi-sport. Most multi-sport athletes do not come from a swimming background. They certainly aren't semi-retired marathon swimmers. So you're leagues ahead of most people when they pivot into the multi-sport arena. Um, Having that swimming background is a huge advantage and fundamental to your success. I think swimmers understand a couple key core things that will serve them as multi-sport athletes, not the least of which is they understand how to suffer. If you're a swimmer who's you know trying to be the best swimmer that you can be, you're no stranger to sensory deprivation, like putting yourself in a position where 
um, you're blocking out everything around mm-hmm. you and you're connecting with nothing but your breath and your body movements and pushing yourself. So um, that's something that's very familiar to you at this point. A lot of multi-sport athletes get into it. They've never really done anything hard. So you have that experience under your belt. You also understand and appreciate the importance of technique. Technique being crucial in terms of success as a swimmer um, and that appreciation to detail and what it takes to become proficient in your stroke will really serve you in terms of the intentionality that you bring to learning how to properly ride a bike, what your cadence looks like, your running form, all of these things are already built into your DNA and aren't things that you're gonna have to learn. So I think swimmers make for great multi-sport athletes because of their backgrounds. And there's something about brain plasticity that makes it so much harder for somebody later in life to really understand how to swim well. Like it's just, it, I don't even know if it's possible. Like once you've reached a certain age threshold, trying to teach stroke technique to older athletes becomes very difficult. But cycling and running, we've all run our whole lives. So we already have background in that. And cycling is very easy to teach. And success in cycling is very much, I mean, I don't want to be too binary about it, but you can learn how to ride a bike older in life and you can get good at it by dint of saddle time and the technique will come along the way. So having the swimming piece already locked down makes your transition really smooth, I think. Also because uh, it tends to be a way to get ahead, right? I mean, like often, like if you're, if you're experienced and good at swimming, uh, you're, you're way ahead than some of these people who might then catch you. <laughs> but, sure, but the but, problem yeah. is like swimming, if proportionality wise, yeah. like swimming gets such Small a- Small part. Yeah, yeah. It, it's like none of these races are oriented around around parity between the three sports. No, but- uh, Swimming becomes swim run, a footnote. Swim well, run, swim run is different. matters a little yeah, more. Yeah, swim yeah. run is different. Yeah, yeah. Um, triathlon specifically though, yeah. The swimming is almost irrelevant, yeah, right, you right, know. Right, yeah. Ultraman is the one race where swimming can can kind of make a difference, but Even for the it's most part, loaded. it's just about like staying with within range, and then everything else uh, makes up for people that aren't good swimmers, and and they allow you to wear wetsuits in in terrain where you know I think that they should just say no wetsuits for the most part. Mm. So it really coddles the non swimmer. Swim run is different for sure but I'm excited about this journey. And I think that, you know, if there's anything um, that you might need to pay attention to that might be new coming from a swimming background is that you have to give, especially with running, you have to give your joints and your ligaments time to adapt to the load. Swimming, because you're in this suspended environment, um, it's very easy on your joints and your ligaments. So you can push yourself really hard. Right. You can recover quickly and you don't have to worry until you get into like tendonitis with shoulders and stuff like that with with severe overuse injuries. Um, You don't have to concern yourself with, you know, your knees hurting or any any of the kind of stuff that comes with running. So you have to build your volume in running much more slowly and diligently than you would have to do with swimming. So paying attention to that, like your lungs and your heart will acclimate and become fit much more quickly than your the like your body's infrastructure's ability to adapt to that load. So even if you feel fit and you want to run longer and you feel like you can, you have to be you have to err on the side of caution to prevent those injuries from occurring. So I think exploring that and learning a little bit more about what that looks like for you will save you time benched from injuries. Uh, but um, I think you'll if you're like me, you'll develop a love and appreciation for these other disciplines. And it will also renew your love for swimming. Like when it's not just all about swimming and you get to mix it up and have this variety, then you look forward to your swims rather than dread them like a lot of swimmers do who have been at it for a very long time. Great stuff. All right, should we move on? Tyler from Florida. I have a Florida man for you. Mm. Florida man, question from Florida man. Hey, Rich and Adam, this is Tyler from Florida. So my question is a morality question. Um, I am a 31, soon to be 32 year old. And the moral topic that I am inquiring about today is money. I used to believe that money was somewhat of an evil thing. And I've since shifted to believe that money is simply a tool. And once I amass enough of this tool, 
then I can retire from the things I do not want to do, a.k.a. my job now, which would then allow me to do things that I want to do, such as work on issues such as food sovereignty, food security, climate change, and the like. So my question is, and I know the answer is um, a very nuanced, but would you suggest someone like myself to make as much money as I quickly and ethically can in the next four to five years to then be able to, quote unquote, retire from the system to then devote my time solely on social justice issues that matter to me? Because I simply don't think I have the mental capacity for both at the same time because I've seen it. When I focus on social social issues, my job suffers. And when I focus on my job, my impact on social issues suffers. So, um, yeah, if you could help me figure out my life, that would be great. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, Adam. I appreciate the question. I'm not sure I can help you figure out your life, Tyler, <laughs> but we're going to give it a shot. Let's give it a shot. I think that uh, the first thing is is understanding as you you know astutely pointed out this is a nuanced thing so you need to break free of this binary thinking like it's either or like my job or social justice or make money or don't make money instead think about money as energy not a thing and 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 approach it from an abundance mentality in other words not like a lack, like if I do this, then I won't have money. If I do this, then I'll have a lot of money, but I'll save it and then I'll use it for this. I think about it, try to hold on to it a little bit more lightly and in a non-binary sense. And I think it will allow you to broaden your perspective on your current capacity. I'm not a fan of staying in a situation that is not serving you to accumulate resources so that you can do something later. I understand there's a prudence and responsibility in that, um, but in terms of a philosophy of life, I don't think that um, it's a good guiding force. I've seen this play out many times over many years with a lot of people. And generally what happens is the person becomes calcified in their lifestyle and rarely, if ever, reaches that inflection point where they're ready to retire and deploy those resources that they've accumulated in some, you know, in, in some kind of socially responsible manner. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but it doesn't happen as frequently as you as you might think. And as somebody who went to law school with a lot of people who said, I'm gonna do the law firm thing for a year, I need to pay off my loans, and then I'm gonna go do the thing that inspired me to go to law school in the first place. I'm sure that only a tiny percentage of those people have actually made good on that aspiration because mm-hmm. that's just the way that life works. Right. So I would caution you against that strategy and I would encourage you to explore ways in which you can indulge that aspiration to be more service oriented in your life in a manner that is sustainable with maintaining your current job and whatever level of responsibility that demands that you stay in that job for you know however long. It doesn't mean that any work or investment of time that you make in the issues that inspire you or ignite you or get you excited need to be at the detriment of your job. Like there's ways to do it more sustainably. So alleviate that pressure on yourself. It's almost like m- my intuition is that you need to feel that pain point. Like if I'm going out there and making a difference, my job is gonna suffer because I need to do it in this particular way that requires that my job suffer. And I think there are methods of effective altruism that would allow you to be engaged in productive solutions without having that downstream impact on your job. Like even if you gave away $100 or $20 a week or a month to one of the, one of the nonprofits that has been approved of in the effective altruism world, you're making a huge difference without requiring any of your time. So it's it's about broadening your thinking in terms of around what that work looks like, while also finding ways within the construct of your job to spark that curiosity that you have about these issues and find ways within the confines of your free time to explore them. 100%, I mean, I don't think there's, 
any reason to wait. Uh, I mean, there's things you can do. You could go to beach cleanups. You can go to a protest. You can organize an event. You can organize a teaching. You know, there's things you can do on weekends that wouldn't necessarily impact your job. Um, if you don't like your job and you don't want to do it anymore, that's a different conversation. Right, and you can be putting energy towards shifting your career focus. Right, like you had said before, like if if you have responsibilities, family, mortgage, you might need to create yourself a runway for yourself mm -hmm. to be able to off ramp. But I also don't like this idea that like you know how much money you're going to make if you do one or the other. Right, like you actually don't. No. Like if you have, if you, say you're in the financial, it sounds to me like you're you know in the financial world right sector who knows who knows but you might think that that, that that's going to be the way you know you'll make money but you don't know how bringing that brain to the social causes and what might prop up in your mind what kind of things might come up for you creatively imagination wise entrepreneurial that will you, you don't know no you don't know the end, it's the, the illusion it. is that there's some kind of security in this certain job right. situation and if the pandemic has taught us anything or you know it's like you or the don't Lehman know brothers. you don't know how long you're going to be right, yeah. yeah you don't know how long you're going to be alive right. you know how long you know that that you know how long that illusion of security will will hold itself up yeah. and this binary thinking of if i do if i'm a do gooder then i'll be poor but if i seek security then i'll be financially stable is also an illusion right to your point like Let's say you go, well, I'm super interested in this ocean plastic problem. And through the course of exploring your curiosity, you meet somebody or you stumble upon an idea that leads to some kind of entrepreneurial venture that not only, you know, ends up cleaning out the ocean, you know, <laughs> addressing this plastic problem, but also makes you very wealthy in the meantime. Like, I think it's about, I think your, your instinct that this is, is finance, you know, that, that he's in the financial industry I, another instinct that I have is that you know there's a it's it's about risk aversion. Like, right. what is your relationship with risk, right? And this feels like somebody who has a certain level of risk aversion. And I think if you address that impulse or where that risk aversion is coming from, you can begin to untangle the knot and look at this from a broader, um, more nuanced, less binary view. Beautiful. All right. Love it, but it's great instincts, Tyler. Thanks for the question. Yeah, appreciate it. Now we're closer to home. Guy up in Pasadena. Hey, Rich and Adam. This is uh, Jason from Pasadena. Uh, I wanted to hear your opinions on something that's been weighing on me a bit, uh, a little bit over the past couple of weeks. Uh, I've recently been doing a lot of reflection on establishing better connections with those around me and spiritually with the with the earth and our connection to it. So internally, um usually pretty pessimistic with a lot of things, but on the surface, I try to remain positive and hopeful about my and our future and the future of the planet. My problem is it's getting harder and harder to remain optimistic in a world that literally seems to be falling apart. So like right now, the Caldor fire is scorching Tahoe and Hurricane Ida, you know, it's basically like laid waste to Louisiana and the, the Northeast has had just like unprecedented rainfall during the summer of 2021, just to mention a couple things. Usually I retreat, you know, out to the wilderness here in California, but the vast majority of that is actually closed now just with the threat of the wildfires. So, uh, so while in the past it seemed like global warming was just hearing about, you know, the Greenland ice sheet melting or something like that, now it really feels kind of like the, the apocalypse is upon us and the earth is just raging across, you know, all parts of the globe. So I guess my question is, how do we remain hopeful, uh, amidst this chaos while trying to reestablish re our innate connection with the planet. Um, thanks again for all the podcast. It's really a bright light I look forward to every week. Thanks a lot, take care. It's a great question. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's a, it's a generational question. I think it's oh, do you? something that uh, is on all of our minds. Like I, you know, I'm, I have to cultivate my own optimism. I think my set point is fairly pessimistic. Oh, you mean generational, like everyone feels this a little yeah, bit. Yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I thought you meant like millennials feel it, but no Well, I think they, I, I think there's a tweak on that. I think there is something to be said about that, like with Gen Z yeah. and, and millennials, like feeling this a little bit more. Um, and with that, uh, you know, kind of a percolating resentment about the generations that have preceded them, right. that created this crisis and this mess that they're forced to contend with. and charged with the responsibility of cleaning it up. And so I'm sympathetic and empathetic to the descent into depression and hopelessness over the whole thing. But hope 
and cultivating hopefulness, I think is really important. And it's a choice, right? And it's a, it's a, um, it's a guiding principle or kind of a litmus test for how you approach everything and how you look at life. And, you know, life is better when you're able to perceive it through an optimistic perspective. And in terms of how kind of functionally productive um, and of service you can be, that's really calibrated, I think, and lockstep with your ability to be optimistic. So I think cultivating optimism and hopefulness is important. Um, understanding that change is possible. Like, again, that goes back to another guiding principle or lightning rod of this podcast. Like, change is possible. Like, how many stories of people have I hosted over the years where people have met unforeseen obstacles and overcome them to transform their lives mm. or some issue that we thought was, <clears throat> you know, impossible to, to navigate and we figure out solutions. So I think the process for Jason begins with baby steps. Like how can you participate in meaningful change for yourself or for other people where perhaps the stakes are low, but you're in a position to actually, you know, do something beneficial for yourself or for others. And I think with each step towards something like that, that you take, you're able to kind of cultivate that hopefulness and optimism within yourselves. Like make a small change for yourself, make a small change for your local community, go out and help another human being. Even if it's as simple as picking up the phone and spending an hour listening to a friend who's going through a hard time, even when you don't have a solution for that friend, just being, uh, you know, a, a sort of non-judgmental sounding board for somebody else's pain is a huge service to do mm. for somebody else. It will, it's something that's gonna make you feel better about yourself. And I think in turn, hopeful and optimistic about the possibility for change when it comes to trickier, more difficult problems. You scale that up, of course, and we're dealing with the existential threat of climate change, but I think mindset around how to approach these problems begins in those lower stakes environment where you're creating that neuroplasticity around your worldview and your perspective about the possibility for positive change. Hmm. Well said, I, I agree with you. I mean, I do think we all are feeling it. It's impossible, like with the level of media saturation we all live with, it's impossible not mm -hmm. to notice these things that might have other, like I think every time has been a troubled time. I think every time has had their, generational issues to contend with. This one, this feels a bit more existential than most, but also what makes it feel that way, I mean, it is, but what makes it feel that way doubly so is the amount of media we get mm -hmm. that is constantly in our in our heads. Um, so I understand why you feel that way. I feel that way sometimes too. <clears throat> but there are, you know, just because we, there's, there's a, there's, we don't always know what's really happening. For instance, there's, there's someone I know who has a, a fly fishing business or I've just been connected to as a fly, fly fishing business in Tahoe and his whole business has been wiped out. But it's not because Tahoe has been on fire. So the Calder fire has been on the outskirts, but he's saying Tahoe has been actually beautiful and that it's, and, and it hasn't like, the wilderness is still lovely and there's still, you know, he's, he is suggesting that the media is, is wrong and in, in it's hurting his business. That doesn't mean that there aren't problems, but the point is that there is, I don't even know, I haven't talked to him yet, but I've just been connected to him. But the point I'm trying to make is within this uh, terror dome that we create in our minds, we're overlooking this oasis of things that are not as bad. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so somewhere we have to start focusing on the things that are positive, right? That's the way forward, right? If you can focus on things that are going well, even as everything else seems to be dwindling, that grows and your consciousness grows with that. So I would say when it comes to despair, um, focusing on beauty first will help you and mm -hmm. focusing on things that are working and synchronicity and, 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 and I think that could help you. Um, yeah. But I, I think you said it better than I've just. Well, I think that, I yeah, think that's yeah, a good yeah, point. Yeah. I think I think it's a you know fair and accurate point. Like the idea, like well, all these parks are closed, so I'm going to stay home. But right. there actually are places that you could go, right. or or areas right in our backyard where we. It, it doesn't have to be on a grand scale. It can be on a small scale. You just go down to the beach or go up on a hike and yep. the San Gabriel's or something like that, and you know try to connect with that 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 you know 
that innate impulse to be at one with nature, I think is important. And I think on top of that, and we talked a little bit about this earlier, when I think about people who have been in this hunt for a long time, the, the Paul Hawkins and, <clears throat> and the Lewis Pews, these are guys who you would think would be completely pessimistic at this point mm. and hopeless because they've been banging this drum for 30, 40 years. And it's only now that people are even beginning to pay attention to what they've been saying for a long time. And yet what you find are two people who are highly engaged mm. in communicating around the problem, highly engaged in solution-based discourse. And more often than not, hopeful about humanity's ability to finally get to a place where we can overcome these problems. Mm -hmm. I mean, Paul Hawken is all about solution and he's so optimistic about humanity. So again, um, in terms of, of trying to plug yourself into some level of, of, of hopefulness around this, Jason, go to regeneration.org slash nexus and start exploring ways in which you can participate in solution-based activism and I think that may alleviate that veneer of pessimism that you're feeling and, and perhaps, you know, re-energize yourself around, you know, around, around the idea of, of being solution-based because we need everybody. We need all hands on deck actively plugged in to um, how we're gonna move forward collectively and optimistic about our ability to solve the problem because the pessimism certainly isn't gonna solve it, mm. right? And so we actually require you to step up and, and shoulder the mantle of optimistic responsibility in this moment and to share that with your peers and your colleagues and your family and your friends. There is a, a quote that Yogi Bhajan used to say, although I know that's <laughs> probably shouldn't say Yogi uh -oh. Bhajan's name anymore, <laughs> but um, Guru Singh used to talk about it. Um, when the pressure is on, begin, and it will be off. And I think of that in terms of writing all the time. Like when you have a deadline, you've felt this with your own sure. deadlines. When you have a deadline and you, you, you just don't wanna get to it or something's stopping you or the procrastination is heavy, or maybe you really still need to do more research, whatever it is, you don't really start right away and it just builds and builds and it gets more and more uncomfortable. As soon as you start, mm -hmm. you feel so much better. Because you, you know, the. So it's exactly what you're saying. As soon as you take action, even in this kind of tragic landscape that you're seeing, and a lot of that is real, um, I think that you'll feel more, you'll, you, you will be on your way to feeling better about the world. Yeah, well said. Yeah. Way to stick the landing. I, th I thank you, because I fumbled a lot in, no. the, in the approach. <laughs> I thought you handled it beautifully. <laughs> thank you. That's a good place to finish. Once again, we entered this conversation thinking we wouldn't have more than uh, 45 minutes to an hour of stuff to talk about. Uh, we might've broken our record for <laughs> longest <laughs> roll on podcast. I don't know. And I'll say it again. I always do like, is this working for anyone? <laughs> like, are we like way off base here? What does this podcast do? W what does this, I don't, uh, you know what? I thought I knew before today's episode, I am back to the drawing board. I have no idea. No idea. Maybe we'll figure it out two weeks from hence. <laughs> a fortnight. A fortnight. A fortnight hence. See you in a fortnight, mate. Right on. Um, I feel good though. How do you feel? Feel great. Cool. Yeah. Uh, follow Adam on all the socials at Adam Skolnick for all your shark content yes. and mask wearing hullabaloo. I don't know. I couldn't think of a word. Yeah. Hullabaloo. Hullabaloo. Fuck, that, that's, uh, uh, yeah, that's there it. You I'm going to start a mask company called Hullabaloo. That's good. That's not bad. Yeah. I still think there's a market for the Skolnick wearing mask, caricature, t-shirt, hoodie that just says <laughs> Skolnick on it. <laughs> We gotta work on that. Yeah. Uh, you can follow me at Rich Roll in all the places, although on TikTok, I am I am I A M Rich Roll. Mm. I'm putting more more and more content up on TikTok. Are you? So exciting. Um, leave us a message if you would like your inquiry uh, queried, 424-235-4626. For links to everything we talked about today, visit the show notes on the episode page at richroll.com. Also a couple links in the description below if you're watching on YouTube. On that note, please don't forget to hit the subscribe button on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, all the places. Uh, what else do I wanna say? I think that's it. I wanna thank everybody who helped put on today's show. Jason Camiolo for audio engineering, production, show notes, interstitial music. 
We have uh, the the added bonus of Kale Curtis, brother of Blake, now oh. on board to supplement our audio engineering. So that's very exciting. Uh, Blake, of course, mans the shop in terms of video. We got Dan Drake assisting on video, also stepping up as our new creative director. Jessica Miranda on um, on graphics, uh, and we have. Uh, oh, and Daniel Solis as well, new guy. We're building our team. We got so Dude, many people now. This team's crazy. Um, Davey Greenberg on portraits today, half marathon runner. He's giving the thumbs up over there. And uh, um, as well as Grayson, w- Grayson Wilder. Oh, sorry. The crew. Yeah, props to the crew to for being able to be so flexible and come in at different times. Yeah, we times. came in early today. Yeah, to, but it's always like that. And everyone's always enthusiastic. Right. You, you got a nice team here. Rich. The team is solid. You know who else is on the team? Who's that? Your boy DK. Hey, hey. For advertiser relationships. You got AJ Akpodiete. That's a beautiful name. Yes. He's manning the TikTok channel right now. See, if that was my if Akpodiete was my last name, it would be on a t-shirt already. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it would be? Yeah. Selling out stadiums. Yeah. <laughs> it is an epic last name. Um, and that's it. Theme music is always by Tyler Trapper and Harry. Thanks to love you guys. See you back here in a couple of days. With another epic episode. Adam, why don't you take us out? Peace, plants.